screen out for you, just so you know it's a little bit slow. Internet. So, but get a mouse. Oh, so I do. I already have this one. Good. Thanks. <laughs> So we have a few things that we want to do today. One is to talk more about um, variation in imaging spending in our data focus series. Um, and then we're going to have a few different um, presentations about things that we're working on, ranging from uh, the impact of the OBA, I think that's the term. Mm -hmm. Did I get the last name correctly? OBA decision, um, some results on low value, low value care, which has been a topic that we've been interested in. And then Ray is going to tell us about a whole bunch of results from Chia and price transparency and variations and things like that. So I'm going to start with Rachel over to you. Yes, just very briefly. Um, uh, so I'm Casey Romeo, the Director of Market Performance here at the HPC. Um, I just wanted to note before turning it over to my colleagues on our research and top trends team that um, the focus of today's meeting, as you see from the agenda, is really on the uh, data and research work of the agency. Our market performance team is hard at work. Uh, completing the preliminary report on the PI uh, Lead Group Health uh, merger. We expect to release that at our next regularly scheduled board meeting on July 18th. Um, so without further ado, I will turn just, uh, just, yes. just one sentence on the process. So after we release the preliminary report, which typically has a number of questions that we want to make and that the parties are open to and for the users, we then come back and agree to that is correct. So the parties have a 30-day opportunity to respond, and after that, um, we would release a final report. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so without further ado, I will turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Scott, and Mike Marswa to talk about the data points on variation of imaging spending. Uh, we're going to talk about our work on the seven paper points on variation of imaging spending in the Medicare population. And for that, I will turn this over to the Wyoming Marshall on our team of data Good morning, Medical 
Medical imaging is a critical part of palliative care in Massachusetts. Uh, it's used in preventive screenings, used to aid in diagnosis, and used to monitor patients throughout the care experience. But uh, nevertheless, imaging spending is an increasing area of attention and scrutiny uh, for controlling healthcare spending. Uh, due to its uh, high utilization in the U.S. and its expense, and the potential for waste and abuse. Uh, given these uh, concerns, the HPC conducted a study of how Massachusetts compares with the other states and the nation on the components of imaging spending. Uh, these include the amount of services are, that are provided, the service mix, uh, state and regional variation in wages and prices. Um, this also includes a setting where care is being given. So with prices uh, for procedures given in hospital outpatient departments, um, uh, having higher prices and there are lower prices in freestanding standing imaging centers and office settings, something that we demonstrated in the 2017 cost report. So for data points number two, uh, number seven, excuse me, um, we identified uh, the top twenty, the top twenty imaging procedures in either the United States or in Massachusetts, which results in a list with considerable overlap. There are eighteen procedures in common um, for a total of twenty-two. We also looked at the variation in the volume of services, prices, and setting of care. Um, we finally calculated annual per beneficiary spending for imaging. We conducted these analyses on a publicly available data set of physician services provided to fee-for-service Medicare patients in 2015. Uh, these data allow us to better understand the drivers of imaging spending. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these are our top 20 uh, procedures in Massachusetts for U.S., uh, which resulted in 22 uh, procedures. Uh, most of our uh, analyses revolve around these 22 procedures, um, with these 22 procedures accounting for about 60% uh, of our total imaging spending. Uh, this table is ranked by the per beneficiary imaging spending in the U.S. Um, and this table here shows for each procedure, uh, their ranking in the U.S. or in Massachusetts, the procedure description and code. And it also shows um, uh, the Massachusetts average price, uh, which is um, weighted to account for differences in price by setting. Uh, and later on, I'll show you how to use Tableau's interactive features to see information on price by setting and annual costs um, in the visualization. Uh, first, let me uh, walk you through some of our key findings. Uh, earlier, I discussed the key components of imaging spending in Medicare, um, our utilization, prices, and where those services are taking place. Uh, overall, we found that Massachusetts was fourth highest spender on imaging services in 2015 among states, with annual per beneficiary spending 14% higher uh, than the U.S. as a whole. Um, and we'll show a little bit later how some of this uh, high spending is attributable to the high use of EKGs. Uh, with respect to utilization, Massachusetts was the 12th among, uh, highest among states, um, with, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, number of services per 1,000 Medicare beneficiaries. We also found that Massachusetts imaging price tags were about 3% to 20% higher than the U.S. as a whole for the top 20 procedures, uh, even for the lower price office procedures. And then finally, with respect to setting care for imaging, uh, the Commonwealth had a relatively high use of hospital outpatient departments, ranking 18 highest among states. Now, let me show you some of these results. We're just going to uh, switch over to the tablet portion, um, which is right on our data point series. Um, right on the website. And, uh, we're going to just go to our uh, first uh, visualization. Visualization I'll show you is number two, um, the annual spending per beneficiary, uh, and uh, we're going to just full screen that, uh, which you can do by just scrolling to the bottom right corner, um, and then you can click the little screen button. Um, so, uh, this visualization will show the annual spending per Medicare beneficiary for the top 20 procedures uh, that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, Massachusetts is in orange and the U.S. is in blue. The procedures are ranked by annual spending per beneficiary in the United States. Um, we can see right at the top that the ultrasound of the heart 
was the uh, imaging procedure with the highest annual spending in 2015. Um, and then if you hover over the bars, as you can see, as Sway is demonstrating for us right now, um, you can see some basic information on the procedure. Um, it's ranking in Massachusetts, Massachusetts weighted price, and you can also see the annual spending per capita patient rate. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, spending and utilization for uh, EKGs is quite high. Um, with annual spending for the average beneficiary 60% higher in Massachusetts. Um, I won't have the utilization results to show you, uh, but um, you'll, if you're able to see um, that, that uh, remains for uh, uh, EKG, even for um, the volume of services. And uh, we also showed you about the facility share later on as well. Um, one other thing that may jump out is that despite the high overall annual spending, um, in Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts does not exceed the U.S. for each one of these procedures um, in terms of annual spending per beneficiary. Um, Tableau also allows us to filter these data uh, based on relevant fields um, with the drop-down box in the right. Um, let's click on the drop-down. Uh, if we do deselect all, and then uh, click uh, advanced imaging, uh, so I'll just show you one of the categories that we're able to uh, show you. I'll just give us a second here. Um, but uh, advanced imaging is a category that's typically the most intensive and highest priced imaging procedures um, and includes uh, CT scans and MRIs. Uh, I'll just show you right now how um, using Tableau, um, we can just uh, group by these different categories. Let's pause and give us a second. And, uh, now I'm just going to move on to um, a different visualization that will show us uh, some information on utilization, which is um, uh, another three services per 1,000 Medicare beneficiaries. All right. uh, this map and the associated bar shows the services per 1,000 Medicare beneficiaries by state in Massachusetts, uh, state in 2015. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Massachusetts ranks 12th among states. On the map, states are categorized by quintile those in the darkest shade of orange having the highest volumes, and those with the lightest shade having the lowest. Um, and you can see this information on the right as well. Uh, if we scroll over the bars or the map, uh, we'll be able to see a little bit of per state information. Um, and though there's not a drop down um, box here of categories, we can filter by state if we want to. And I'm going to move on to our final visualization, which is the uh, share services performed in facility by procedure. I mentioned earlier that aside from utilization and prices, a key driver of spending is where the service is taking place. And in particular, services taking place in a hospital outpatient department are more expensive than at freestanding imaging centers or office centers, um, even for the same service. So in this graphic, um, we can see the share of services performed in hospital outpatient departments. Again, Massachusetts is in orange, and the U.S. is in blue. Procedures are ranked by the annual spending in the U.S. as the previous visualizations. Uh, the hover and filter features are also available here. Um, one thing that may jump out is that unlike our bars before, Massachusetts always leads the U.S. in facility share of the top 20 procedures. Um, this gives us uh, a picture where Massachusetts leads in facility share um, over the U.S. average uh, with with us being able to, uh, with us always uh, leading the U.S. Um, so these are our results um, from the <coughs> imaging data points. There are actually uh, three other visualizations um, that you can see on data points number seven. Um, and with that, if uh, there are any questions from the commissioners. Can we start off with the questions? So first, thank you. The first bullet on the key findings says that imaging was 14% in Massachusetts than in the nation. How much of that 14% is price differences and Massachusetts formula differences? Well, we didn't we didn't do a decomposition of those different factors, but um, but but in terms of sort of. Uh, a big picture of the relative values. It, the difference in prices is is fairly small. It, um, uh, well, it, 
care was volatile relative. So, the, the facility use. Well, the facility use is, is a much larger yeah. I mean, driver of prices. I mean, prices. I mean, yeah. 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 So, if you had to say, you say most of it was quantity, that we just use these procedures more, use these, yeah, use these top 20 procedures more than other states? There, uh, there was, um, I, I would say all the factors that we looked at were, were fairly large contributors that weren't any that were, um, you know, you, you can even sort of get a, a sense based on the, the relative rankings. They're, they're all playing their part. Uh, did you get any information on geographic variations in these rates across the state? Was this purely heavily on the entire state? It's a good question. We, we just looked at we just looked at the state as a whole. That would be interesting. It's a little. It would be a. Um, so it, it could be done. I was thinking through the limitations of the data, but it it could be done by some other method. For, for some of these, we found. Some expenses to make the service inappropriate. Do you, were you, were you able to look at what share, like what was inappropriate to use? Because later on, we're actually, uh, Rosie and Laura actually came to uh, um, share with us. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the results I'm looking at uh, uh, low value care measures. Some of the some of those are imaging procedures. Yeah, we can share some share some of that data. But there may be other literature that would allow them to do some more of these procedures. Yeah. In particular, if you can do the multi-tone and the one to one, as to when it would be appropriate and when it would be less appropriate. Absolutely. I mean, I think you know, one one thing of research that could be done is using some of the tones and the measures that uh, Rosie and Laura were able to look at. Uh, we could look at uh, you know, imaging, uh, those procedures that have imaging. Unfortunately, uh, this is not common local data, uh, so some of those require um, bi condition or uh, other um, uh, factors in the care experience uh, to uh, be able to give us a sense of if it's a low value measure or not. Uh, and so we weren't able to do that with this study. Overall, it is Even at, a, even at a high level, it's, it's really interesting to be able to look by procedure and see um, different, different, different uses of services by state. I think there, there would, um, even though the results aren't closely adjusted, there's, I think there's not, um, it, it would be reasonable to assume that there's not um, vast differences geographically that would account for large I start um, on the next presentation, I'm going to introduce Laura Masudi, who is a recent uh, member of our team. She has my way of BPH and MPP options, and she has a PhD in neurons. So we took her and turned into a Cochinelle person. <laughs> <laughs> so, very exciting. Um, I'll be uh, doing most of the presentation, but Laura did a lot of the work, and Rachel uh, also is going to be doing the um, So, this, this is a, a mini a mini investigation that I met. We were interested in exploring the implications of the loss of a, a good amount of the self-insured claims from our ABCD, which we've been using for a number of analyses, as you know. Um, <coughs> this is the uh, Gobia decision, that the implications will start to be felt with the 2016 set of data and going forward, um, 
which we haven't received yet. So far, our analyses have been up, up through 2015. So what we're going to do is show you with the 2015 data where we have all of it, what would be the implication of chopping out uh, a chunk of the frames that we expect to lose. Um, so you can, I'll show you the magnitudes of what that means. About half of the Massachusetts commercially insured market is currently self-insured. About half is fully insured. The self-insured means we're going to be here to sure that self-insured <coughs> frames are where the employer is really taking on the risk. The employer is paying for the medical costs of their employees directly and maybe using the insurer to just help administer the benefits and so on. Versus the fully insured where the employer says, hey, insurer, I'm going to pay you a fixed amount uh, for all of my employees. And if the spending turns out to be more than that, that's on you. So it's a, it's a bit of a negative in that sense. Um, and again, the Supreme Court decision said that APCDs, states cannot compel employers in that self-insured situation who are covered by ERISA to uh, provide the payment to the states. They don't have to do it anymore. Some of them still do, as I'll show, but they don't have to. Half of the commercial market, it's not half of the firms, it's half of the lives, right? Is that what half of the lives, yeah. lives. Yep. yes. It's, and it's, it's not an even balance. It's mostly the larger firms that need a self-insured thing because they, they, can, they have a big population and they can sustain the risk of their healthcare costs being particularly higher low than the smaller firms. And another, yes. Um, we've broken down the 2015 claims that we have into these three groups. 
that's how many members covered lives we have in the fully insured number. Those will still be in the data. And then you see the GIC there. Those will also still be in the data. There's about 130,000 folks there. And then there's this third group. 40% uh, of our current data set um, is the group that we will lose probably most of. But as you saw, some of the Harvard Pilgrim and some of the top findings are still going to be in that data. But a priority, we don't know which ones they're going to be. So in the, in the rest of the presentation going forward, I'll be comparing um, the data in the dark blue to the data in the patch blue and see what how they look different and what the implications of losing that patch area would be. I have a question. Um, Harvard Pilgrim, you have 75%. How do you know right. you 75%? Do they tell you they tell 25%? I, uh, yeah, I, I'm guessing that she is comparing the, the number of plane lines they're getting from that pair in 16 to 15. And so it's 75% of what they got the previous year. Yeah, something like that. So it's, it's not a perfectly precise number, but based on prior. So here's some here's some top line numbers. I mean, we were also just curious to know how these populations differ in their own right. Um, and so uh, on the top two rows, I'm comparing the fully insured and the self-insured, and then breaking down the self-insured into subgroups of the GIC, which we will still get, and the non-GIC. There's the number of adults is about even uh, for both overall groups. The striking thing that you notice is that the risk score, the health of those self-insured folks, is, is worse, the higher risk by about. 15%. They have more chronic conditions, they're more female, um, uh, fewer in HMOs, and they are older. So you can see the unadjusted spending is about $1,000 higher. This is claimed spending per person. Um, but then when we risk adjust that, divide by the risk score, those differences pretty much go away and you're left with almost the same risk adjusted spending. And then in the GIC, you can see that the GIC subset um, is in fact even higher risk. 1.11 is their average risk score. This is on a 1.0 normalized basis, so they're 10% sicker than the rest of the population. Even more chronic conditions, um, higher, higher unadjusted spending, but again, the same risk adjusted spending pretty much as the average. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to do, uh, if there are no questions there, was to look at some of the analyses that we've been doing lately. How might those be affected? So I'm gonna highlight where we've been uh, comparing spending across provider organizations based on patients attributed to them and exploring differences there. Mm -hmm. And so this is, again, those three subsets of data for each provider organization on the bottom. This is 2015 data, and you see the, <coughs> the blue is the fully insured folks, the orange is the non-GIC non self-insured, most of them we will lose, and then the yellow is the GIC, which we will retain um, by provider organization there. And, um, you know, the main takeaway is that they're pretty similar. Is that as we look, as we expect in the literature, if I'm atrius and I see a patient I don't really treat differently, whether they're in an HMO or fully insured, or whether they're in a self-insured plan, the spending is pretty similar for each of the three groups of ours. Um, the GIC is a smaller population, and there's more ups and downs there, partly just because there's it's a smaller smaller number. So this is largely a, a reassuring slide. Um, and so then I'm going to focus in on that just a little bit more, and we wanted to <coughs> decide if it was a better proxy to use the GIC and the fully insured who we will have as we move forward, or should we just use the fully insured and throw out those GIC guys, which we thought probably wouldn't be a good idea, but just to confirm that, we looked at the correlation for each of these provider groups of, if you just had fully insured spending with the full population, that's 0.967, very highly correlated. And then the correlation of your fully insured and your GIC folks with the total of everybody, slightly higher, 0.97. These are good. Um, these are risk-adjusted spending. Yeah. They're super high correlations. So I'll show you in a scatter, scatter plot in a second and you'll see it visually. So we decided, yeah, let's in the future assume that we're going to use the GIC claims. We'll have them. It gives us a slightly better proxy for the full population that we won't have anymore. Um, you can see those PMPYs are penalty close. Three dollars different. Um, so here is a scatter plot of each of those fourteen provider organizations, and on the, on the x-axis is their spending for just their fully insured and GIC folks. On the y-axis is their spending for everybody in 2015, and they're all very close to that 45 degree line. 
So you would have a, get a pretty much a similar ranking, a similar impression if you just had the fully insured and GIC data. But I'm highlighting that there are some differences. Who's, who's the farthest from that line? You have Atreus, for example. If I only had their fully insured and GIC folks in 2015, I would think their spending was 2.2% lower than if I had <coughs> them. For example, for CMIPA, I would have had their spending as 2.6% higher than the Europeans. So that's sort of the magnitude of how far we might be off at this aggregate level of a provider board. Not too far off. Then we honed in on a different sort of statistic. Um, we might be interested in what percent of total spending happens in the hospital, inpatient or outpatient. And let's look at that by provider organization. That's, um, that's again, very similar whether I have the, the, the subpopulations of the fully insured and GIC or the whole population on the left. Um, one outlier there was BMC. Um, they're a fairly small group to begin with, and we that's, that's not a, unexpected. We've heard that BMC, a lot of their self-insured folks are their own employees, and they tend to use a lot of their care in the hospital where they're working, and even if it's other, somewhere else, it would be just a regular office visit. Probably going to show up as a, a hospital outpatient department visit for them, or for whatever reason, they're a little bit, a little bit of an outlier. But the statistic is largely the same. Then wanted to do one more analysis to look at. Sometimes we look at prices, and sometimes we might care about about the tail, about small numbers, and we're going to lose a significant number of claims. So. Here on the top, we're looking at the distribution of prices, total prices paid by the payer for colonoscopies in 2015. There's about 32,000 uh, instances in that distribution. One thing you notice is, wow, that's really wide. You've got uh, in the fat of the curve, people paying 1,400, 1,200, and then there's some like up in the two, 3,000 range. Um, so that's interesting to itself. You see the distribution of, of prices paid in the in the full population in the blue, and then the fully GIC in the orange, and those lines are fairly on top of each other. So we would get a similar impression of, of the distribution of prices. But in the graph below, I'm highlighting, what if we really cared about the people who are paying very high prices and wanted to kind of get some detail and highlight people on that right tail? Um, so I'm switching from percentages of members to total ends, and you can see in that blowout that um, people paying 3,000, 3,300, 3,400. The, the yellow is when I only have the fully insured in GIC, I have fewer observations, fewer people to look at, and then I even get some cell size suppression uh, issues there. So I am losing some of that detail, just as you would expect from losing about 40% at, at most of the total claims. I want to look at a, you know, a small group or a, people paying very high prices. A lot of those might be your out-of-pocket, out-of-network. So, yes. So it seems like you're throwing out more than you need to to just the fully insured and the GIC. That, that's true. This is kind of a, wor a worst case because we will get some of those. It's like, you know, you've got 75% yeah. of the education and the percentage seems to have 80% are opposite. Right. I, I almost wonder whether it's worth just doing a weighting adjustment. You keep everything in there, maybe a weighting adjustment based on who you think we're missing. Yeah. Although it, it's it's still a, we still would be losing most of Blue Cross because Blue Cross yeah. is more than half. They're not Blue Cross is more than half. Yeah. But, but you could still. But I could probably get that good information and then use the appropriate weights. Yeah. So that'd be great work, David. Uh, just uh, one level down. I'm just the policy level in this case comparison. Since we're looking at cost trends within the payer. And since Blue Cross is so different from other payers and some additional information as far as we know, one policy relevant question is does this uh, does this lead lead to distortions in our estimates of the relative price trends with Blue Cross compared to others? And I don't know if you can possibly respond to that because it's a second order question whether it would be relevant for us to do our surveillance. That's a good question. We we are in fact working price trends exactly like that this year. Apparently um Katya and Ian are looking at price on that and and we, we will be able to to explore that. It's a subject. It's a sub that it's it's
is a good point. And there, there are differences between A and C. I also want to note that this, this, this whole discussion is relevant also for the market performance team that uses this data. So it's not just a uh, team analysis team that shares the data. chose a set of measures that we can be measured in claims data because that is the data that we will be working in. We have grouped them into uh, four categories, imaging, preoperative care, procedures, and screening. Uh, I do want to highlight, though, that just because we have a measure or a screening or a preoperative care procedure listed here does not mean that it is always low value. It is only low value under a specific set of circumstances. And again, we're only looking at ones that we felt like we could measure in claims data. Uh, for this, we are using the Massachusetts APCD. As we mentioned, we look at uh, the three big payers, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Harvard Children, and Tufts. Uh, we, for this research, we created a cohort of about 2.4 million commercial members that had at least a year of continuous enrollment between the two-year period of October 1st, 2013 and September 30th. This was because for several of these measures, we need to look back period to ensure that a person does not have a medical condition or other claim um, procedure that could indicate that the service might be of value. So that was one of the things we did to try and make sure that any estimate we're providing today is, is conservative. Um, again, we only looked at measures that could be included in claims data. Uh, we excluded from consideration all claims from members uh, where they had a diagnosis where it indicated that the service may be of any value. We only counted the direct costs associated with claims, so that means um, when if, if somebody had multiple procedures on the same day, we actually only took the cost of that, that particular claim line and attributed it to the total spending, the total low value care spending. Um, and for screening specifically, we uh, only counted the first instance of a test. So if it was a vitamin D test, if, if a member got five tests, we assumed that the first test was a low value care screening if it met the criteria, but that the other four might be downstream monitored. Get into Rosie will get into the specific the 19 specific measures, but at a high level, um, of our 2.4 million commercial members, almost one in four experienced some instance of low value care. So that's about over this two year period. So that's about 538,000 members, um, and this ended up accounting for 79.4 million dollars. 13.4 million of these dollars came from the members themselves as out-of-pocket spending. Uh, Rose is going to talk about this a little bit more, but I do want to highlight that uh, the, the encounters don't necessarily correlate with the spending. 82% of the of the encounters that we see are screening, so screening is the predominant um, cause for uh, a member being experiencing a low-value care instance. Uh, those in general, though, are lower costs. So when we look at the low value care spending, we're seeing that it's uh, screening only makes up 
Whereas, like Leiden was talking about with imaging, imaging can tend to be, imaging procedures can tend to be costly, although it's only 14% of our total encounters, it's 44% uh, of our total is spending. We're not just using short measures either. We're using a, a compilation of measures from different resources. Um, Washington Health Alliance and Minnesota have also put up out reports around the value here. So we're using some of those measures as well. Okay. So as Laura mentioned, um, a large number of members are receiving low value stripping. And while these tests are not individually costly, uh, because there is such a high volume, the spending really adds up. So, for instance, we identified almost 330,000 people with a low value screening for vitamin D. And while that's only about $47 per test, that is almost $16 million in spending. And unnecessary screening, while it's not especially invasive, uh, it can be particularly harmful when it leads to false positives, which can in turn lead to uh, follow-on costs and procedures that someone might not have had if they didn't initially have an unnecessary screening. We are attempting to. We have a fellow this summer who is um, going to help us develop a framework. <laughs> um, now, as we know from Leiden's presentation, uh, Massachusetts does image at a, at a high rate, um, and at least some of that imaging is unnecessary and could be considered low value. So, over seven measures, we identified over $35 million during this time period. And uh, that includes $7 million of out-of-pocket spending on the part of patients. Back imaging for non-specific low back pain um, is especially a problem because it was actually the measure we looked at that had the most spending associated with it. Here we're looking at encounters. So for screenings, we looked at people because those are it's reported as a population of the screening, but um, in for our other measures, we count them as encounters, which means that one person can be counted multiple times if they have uh, more than one low-value care episode for the same thing, <coughs> or for different things. We also looked at a set of low-value procedures and preoperative tests which are a problem not because they're particularly frequent, but because when they do happen, they can be especially costly and invas invasive for patients. So, for instance, over only about nine, well, only, it, it should be zero, but about over 9,500 low value procedures that we looked at, we identified over $9 million in spending. So for someone who had arthroscopic surgery for the osteoarthritis that was not indicated, the spending associated with that was over $2,000. Now we also looked at low value care by provider organization. And um, out of our population of 2.4 million people, uh, we were able to attribute 1.6 million members to one of the top 14 largest provider organizations in the state based on the, the member's primary care provider. So this graph shows um, the proportion of attributed members at each organization that experienced at least one low value procedure uh, or screening or preoperative or imaging. Um, and so we see that most of the variation in low value care by provider organization is driven 
by screening. So the solid bars here <coughs> represent people that were affected by screening at a given organization, a, a low value care episode in the form of screening. Um, and the hashed part is the people that experienced low value care um, but did not have a low value screening. So at every organization, there are some people that did have both a screening and a non screening. And here they're counted as among the screening part. But that's about 1 to 2% of the people attributed at each organization. Same. These are percentage of members. How do you attribute a member to an organization? Um, so there is more detail on that in the class strength report. It's not a methodology that I was part of developing, but um, essentially, if someone is in an HMO in the member eligibility file, it will say who their um, primary care provider is. If they don't have one from that source, then you look at it, like their wellness and sick visits and who they see for those. Uh, so just to be clear though, when we attribute costs to a provider organization, it does not mean that the 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 serve in, in this model where we're attributing a patient to say Atrius, it doesn't mean that the services were all received at Atrius. It it just means that their the person's primary care provider was attributed to Atrius and then we're looking at variation of A lot of it is vitamin D. It'd be interesting to show these figures from us and say, look, did you know that a third of your members are getting vitamin D? Just so they have US actually they're not they don't make a recommendation about it, but it gives them a cost to terms of not patient but the recommendation. So why do you do that? I would know um, in the previous time that we report on low value care. Organizations, I would know, for example, we had a conversation with Boston Medical Center, who has, um, in our previous work and here too, had lower rates of low value care for their members. And they told us about some things that they had done internally in terms of data tracking, like flags and their electronic health records, um, as well as having clinical champions that were really uh, working with their colleagues on, on reducing the provision of low value care. Uh, additionally, at that time, we also had conversations with organizations that had higher rates of low value care, um, including uh, Leahy, which is at, at the top of this chart. Um, and I think at that time they had expressed um, some surprise, um, candidly, around uh, that. And so uh, part of this, through this work, we hope that we can be able to provide information to organizations that they may not know about where they rank vis-a-vis -vis their peers um, and be able to uh, help uh, provide a foundation for them to take action on their own to reduce some of this sort of you know, uh, for a parking lot idea, uh, there's so much work going on around the country, around the world now, which is why it may be this issue of intervention is a particular topic that will cross trans areas as they're able to now worldwide. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I will just note that um, while there is a lot of variation across organizations, um, Every organization has a lot of room for improvement. We also looked at total spending on low value care per attributed member at these organizations, and we found that it ranged from $27 per attributed member at Reliant to $53 per attributed member at Leahy. You'll notice here that um, while the costs vary a lot, uh, the way it's divided is fairly consistent. So at every organization, about half of the low value care spending is on imaging. <clears throat> this slide shows all of the measures we looked at as an index. So for each measure, 
Um, and I'm sorry, you can't really see the names of the provider organizations very well, but um, for each organization, uh, their measures are arrayed along the line left to right. Um, and every measure is centered at one. So in red, you have the composite score of the organization overall. So at the top is Bay State, um, which, has, which is performing across all of these low value care measures at about 85% of the state average. Well, at the bottom, you have South Coast, which is performing these measures uh, combined at a rate of about 130% of the state average. Uh, this slide is also an index, and here we've arranged it by the categories that we looked at. So here, um, there's a lot of variation across categories. So for preoperative testing especially, um, the lowest organization is quite low and the highest is quite high. Um, but for organizations that were doing uh, one category uh, lower than the average, they tended to be doing more than one lower than average um, and vice versa. The ones that were performing pretty high on any one category tended to be performing pretty high on multiple categories. But out of the 14 organizations, um, nine of them were above average on at least one category. And I will stop here to take any questions. Since it's 80 million dollars, what kind of number of kids are we doing every year right now? How does this fit into our education scale opportunities for these studies? And this is kind of bringing it. Yeah. This seems like something we should be doing all the time. You know, we, we focused as a commission a lot on, on first degree care, but that's like a safe decision for me. It's not quite the right choice that maybe it's like a 1.7 on the organization. And we sort of always know that the use of outpatient services for people in these age group and services is higher in the Commonwealth, and now we see that quite this morning. And, um, but I think we, we as a commission kind of put as much attention to it. a single big decision is to do this for this or do this for that or do this for this other thing. There's all these separate decisions. But it may be that a way into that is to think about the low value care where it's there is this list out there and you can access that care. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to be saying, well look, we know imaging is higher and therefore it could be reduced but that's not the case. We know it's higher, we know it could be reduced and here's sort of clinical measures. These things in particular are way more dangerous for these people. And you know, here are all the following costs and here's how much it costs and how many people are going. So this may be a way into that bucket that we haven't really done any kind of numbers to yet. Do you agree on a pulse or some geographic variation of the area that we have? Mm -hmm. uh, I just a little caution I know, which is we just want to list the titles of things that should never be done. Choosing the wisely is what it says. Not true that the right number is zero. Certainly, it's not true. There's some research that says, well, we should have been smarter about investigating the actual risk. Yeah, so I will note that we have, so we follow, we did not design any of our own specs here. We did follow the literature. And uh, right off the bat, for each of these measures, um, we excluded anybody for whom there was an indication that they should receive one of these procedures. So there is certainly a lot of exclusions already built in here. In that sense, it's, it, <clears throat> it is sort of close to, it's sort of close to the post-acute institutionalization because very good at that is not zero. But we do go to some of the organizations and say, you know, look, you're at two thirds and other folks are at one third. And we suspect it's probably not true that you need to be at two thirds and they, you know, 
data would need to be a one-third to really like look at that. Uh, my instinct would be that the, the, the low the low users are probably not far from right. Yeah. It's just like it's some some yeah, the, the very deviated criteria for us. Special guest presentation. We are delighted to welcome Ray Campbell from our sister agency at the Center for Health Information and Analysis. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be at the APC, our sister agency. Um, Estimate your out-of-pocket cost, uh, 
Um, we can estimate it, but we certainly can't show it because your out-of-pocket cost is a function of what um, insurance product you have, the status of your deductible, you know, any tiers or network limitations, things like that. So what we show is the full paid amount. And uh, we can talk about the value that has, and I think it does have value. Um, but in particular, we think of all the things that an individual should know before they go um, shopping for care. Certainly checking with your insurer to understand your out-of-pocket cost is an important one. We're happy to show you based on our data what the full paid amount is, but it's really this purple box. It's these decision support guides. Um, if you're gonna go get an MRI, uh, we think there's a lot of questions that you should, you should probably understand some of the basics of what the procedure is. And then you should be armed with information on how to talk to your doctor about whether you need an MRI, where to have an MRI, uh, questions to talk to your insurer about coverage or options, things like that. So we've developed decision support guides in that purple box for all of the procedures that we have price information for. And in the future, we're going to make that you can't even get to the price information without being uh, sort of confronted with the decision support guide. The concept being that Google, um, you know, uh, part of the key to their wealth, one of the keys to their wealth, is that it's very hard to find people that are interested in consuming a toaster. Uh, most people filter out that type of information. But if you find somebody on the search engine searching for the word toaster, then you've certainly found a sub-segment of the population that are likely to be very interested in the toaster ad. By the same token, it's hard to get people to think about what they should ask their doctor about an MRI. But if you find people on the website searching for the cost of an MRI, then you've probably found people that are willing to absorb that information. So we want this purple channel to be a very important part of what we bring um, to the transparency conversation. So it's less about pure price trans uh, transparency, more about giving people the information they may need to make better decisions. And in fact, for the next iteration of uh, Compare Care, we're going to be incorporating the Choosing Wisely content into these decision support guides so that um, we can have that uh, information available in a consumer-friendly way. And then the fourth, the, the um, uh, orange box at the far right, that is um, a troubleshooting, a, a tool for reporting various information to the government. There's certain regulatory functions that the state plays that um, we're happy to play, and you know, to the extent that people need to report a problem, like a difficulty finding coverage or difficulty finding a provider, um, we consolidated a bunch of reporting capabilities under that orange box. So those are the four broad uh, capabilities of compare care. As I said, we're happy to drill down on any of those in more detail. Okay, um, I guess actually I uh, kept it on the landing screen um, and talked through essentially the points on, on this slide. Uh, the last thing that I will say, so I talked about um, four boxes, um, and this slide says five main types of information. What you don't see on this slide, which you will see when you actually go to the website, is before you can get to the home page, there's a large splash screen that says what you should understand about cost information or about Chia's cost information. We essentially make it very clear to people because the, the, the number one concern expressed by payers and providers alike when we talked about our transparency plans, they were concerned that we might confuse their members. Uh, that they would see a price from Chia that didn't correspond to the price in the real world, come in with a printout and say, why isn't this the price that I'm getting? So the first thing you see when you come to the website is a, is a disclaimer, essentially. We want to make it very consumer friendly, saying, you know, you're lucky to live in a state like Massachusetts where, by law, your health plan has to give you a cost estimate. So if you're looking for your out-of-pocket cost, click here and you'll go to your health plan's cost estimator. We've included links right there on the landing page to the cost estimators of um, many, not all of the health plans, but many of the health plans that do business in Massachusetts. And it's, we don't just dump you off to their homepage, we take you directly to their cost estimator. So we're very interested in people understanding and accessing their health plan's cost estimator. So it's an unusual play for a website that the first thing you get is a link to go somewhere else, but we want to be absolutely certain that people understand what we do offer and what we don't. Um, and so anyway, so links to carriers' websites is a key piece. Do you report which hospitals When we show some of the price variation data, we'll see what looks like, what seem to be certain artifacts of that, but we, you know, that would require further analysis. I think it would be worthwhile if there were a way to do it, to show, like, choose either the best hospitals or which is efficient or how the network decision would be stuck to the PPO. It wouldn't be a terrible thing for <clears throat> that's, people to know that. Absolutely, that's a great point. I will say, that's a good um, the data that we're currently showing is all outpatient. Um, we're <coughs> going to be expanding the procedure set in the future, but um, initially it's all outpatient. Yes. Particularly for the outpatient stuff, that's really where a lot of people see the A lot of those services. Great. Wait, how many people do public aware of this stuff? 
mean, initially we've had a fairly soft launch strategy in terms of we're really, first and foremost, we want to make sure we um, establish and maintain credibility with the stakeholders. I think that if this is something that the payers and providers think is a bad idea or a bad tool or gives bad information, it's sunk at that point. So I think first and foremost, we want to have a, a really active and heavy solicitation of the stakeholders, make sure we get their buy in, and I think we've accomplished that. Um, we now have essentially a platform on which we can, if it's up, it's running, it's working, the stakeholders are satisfied, we have good plans for enriching the content. We're now kind of looking for the right opportunity to do something higher profile with it, and I'll talk about with our big transparency project, we're going to have a data challenge that we think will be fairly high profile. We think there's opportunities to, to tell the website. But just being realistic, none of these sites around the country have generated a whole lot of retail traffic. Um, my hope would be, you know, we do point everybody to their health plan, we want to point people to their health plans uh, sites because there's critical information there. I'd love to see a world in which our traffic goes up as fast as the traffic at health plan websites because people really should go to their health plan before they have some of these procedures to learn certain things, including their out-of-pocket costs. I think if they're going to do that, if they're going to make that effort, then they should come to our website and see the actual full paid amounts, to see uh, the decision support <coughs> guides, to see um, our clearinghouse of quality information on those provider organizations. So I'd love to see the use of our site climbing in parallel with the use of the private commercial <coughs> sites. But as of now, we haven't really pushed a hard launch strategy. It's been more get it out there, make sure it's running, make sure the stakeholders are happy. <laughs> They have gotten better. Um, the Pioneer Institute did a study not long ago assessing, they'd done a study perhaps two years ago um, saying the quality was fairly weak. They've gotten better, there's a long way to go. It's one of the things Chia wants to help support is, is as much as we want to point other people to, to the plan's websites, we want to encourage the, the health plan to make sure their websites are worth going to. May I think it's worth just showing the website real quick and just people going, absolutely. Actually, Andrew, do you want to just take over? Yeah, sure. Do we can mic you up? You can narrate. That's quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you going to go uh, what procedure pricing? Uh, sure. So, he's not, you can enter a specific CPT code or even the name of the procedure if you want to, or you can browse by procedure type. I'm interested in the robotics. <laughs> <laughs> so then you come to a screen um, where, depending on the procedure you uh, pick, there's more granularity to decisions, a bunch of decisions around how much granularity to show. This is an example of that splash screen that I talked about. We want to make it even sort of friendlier, but it, it's a right upfront warning to people about what you should know about the costs on this site. And if you're looking for your out of pocket, um, you get a better estimate from your health insurer with live links to their cost estimators. Um, and then down below, it's sort of a banner ad, if you will, for the decision support tool. So it's really the first thing we want people to know before they even see prices, because we're telling you the full paid amount, is that you have access to your out of pocket cost estimates from your insurer. And please be sure to check out our you know, quality and decision support information. We really want to be pushing those aspects, not just the price amount. So then you get through, you see the procedure that uh, Andrew selected, um, a description of what's included and not included in the price, because um, sometimes you know, you know, these are only outpatient that we're talking about, but there's sometimes subtleties around facility fees and such. Uh, and then you see a list of Provider organizations sorted by the lowest price first. And there's a row of filters that you can choose from um, distance from your zip code, provider type, <coughs> provider by name, or insurance provider, insurance uh, plan. And then for any uh, one of the providers, uh, we always have a quality button. Um, whenever you see a price, there's going to be a quality button. The problem is, you know, what is the quality measure? There isn't, um, at least I don't know of any, for, um, uh, for a colonoscopy per se. And so what we give is general quality information. If, there isn't, if there's something on the procedure, we'll use that. If there isn't anything specific to the procedure, we give you um, general um, quality report card on that organization. Uh, this is pulling from Chia. has lots of different quality information. We're sort of a clearinghouse of quality data. Um, we do have aspirations in the future that we can pull even more information into these pages, making very consumer-friendly um, report cards on uh, 
provider organization. So that could be a bad thing. <laughs> this is like the, co uh, yeah, the cookies yeah. normally get us around this far. <laughs> it depends on exactly how much you might be a local one. Good job, Bob. This is. Uh, okay, so this is the quality channel. Um, <laughs> well, okay, and actually, I'll point out one of the things that we're getting at here, and this will get to the big transparency, <laughs> is that what we're trying to, until we release the data file that has all the data, we're trying to um, limit the ability of people to write scripts that would go in and pull all of the data out of the website in one fell swoop. Um, so we have the, the front end to prevent scripting. Uh, but so you can, um, as with other parts of the website, enter a, a search for an organization, enter their name and their part, and things will come up. Here we've used, uh, this is CMS um, hospital compare data. Uh, we wanted to go with something that we had uh, data on all the hospitals. We have leapfrog data, but there was some concerns because it's voluntary that there were, you know, it was not fair to show it. Um, we didn't for this first phase. We'll make decisions about what we do in future phases. You can drill down on each one of these categories and get more and more information um, as you go. Um, and we're happy with this first uh, iteration of it, but once again, the idea is, well, we, in the lower right, you see a purple button help improve this website. We very much want to take the crowdsourcing approach to this. We know this first iteration isn't the end stage of this. So we want to hear from people what information you're expecting that we don't have, because there certainly must be that. Um, and other suggestions on how we can present it in a more legible or uh, comprehensible way. So we think this is a good first step, but we plan to iterate this aggressively over the next several years. So um, in this quality section, is it just hospitals? Is it physician groups? For, it's for everyone, um, but it varies depending on type. So we don't have CMS hospital compare data, for instance, for doctors. They're the only thing we could do that was uh, universal. Is, uh, it's a hot link to their forum registration page. Um, but that's actually a bunch of useful information that most people probably have trouble navigating to. So from our website, one click, you'll see their forum. So information about their schooling, their credentials, um, malpractice history, things like that. It's, once again, it's a start. I, we see this as a platform from which we want to do future improvements, uh, not as the kind of final effort. Um, this is an example of one of the decision support guides, in this case, colonoscopy. Um, top section, learn the basics. What is it that performs and where can I get it? Then questions specific to have with your doctor, and this goes back to what Dr. Uh, Cutler was saying, of um, how you know, we really need to have informed, maybe with um, uh, Dr. Berwick, about uh, patients talking to providers is really the best way to get people to choose wisely. We want to inform people or give people the information they need. Just how do you talk to your doctor? A lot of people don't know they can ask their doctor questions or push back on certain things like site of service and so on. So we want to arm people with that information. Similarly, questions to talk to their health plan about. So we see this uh, aspect of the site as, as really more important, uh, frankly, than, than just the raw price data. But if we also think it's synergistic, we think that people will come potentially to the price data, then we want to expose them to the other Do you want to show anything else, or I think that I means so that's the of the of the major um, buckets of functionality in compare care. Um, those are them. So then, um, talking about next steps, uh, we do want to actively uh, hear from users. Um, we did our made our best effort, but uh, we certainly think there was something concrete in front of them. We should get good reactions that will point us in a good direction. We've also had lots and lots of discussion with stakeholders. Um, we got a bunch of feedback that we incorporated in this version, uh, but as people started to realize this is really going to happen, um, a lot of good ideas surfaced when it was too late to incorporate them, so we're already trying to uh, bake those into a phase two. Um, so we'll be doing a, a major update nine to 12 months from now um, and rolling updates to the website uh, between now and then. Uh, some of the uh, things that we're planning to incorporate or that we will be incorporating in the future as I mentioned, the choosing wisely, uh, the Massachusetts-specific content that um, uh, MHQP has developed. Um, we're going to be expanding the procedure set to include inpatient services and more complex outpatient services, drug and pharmacy prices. Currently, we only have um, local eight local payers. We'll be expanding it to include national payers. We want to include volume information. So 
just generally expanding the amount of information that's available on the Compare Care website. Um, so then switching gears, as I said, behind, uh, so the procedure pricing tool, which is something that a half a dozen or maybe 10 states have a consumer transparency website that has a procedure pricing tool, um, we decided, or it occurred to us, not sure why other states haven't pursued this idea, that if we're willing to expose that data um, at a you know, kind of page by page level, why not release all of it in a single file? And that's uh, an idea we've been working on called big transparency, for the, kind of the idea of big, uh, big data approach to transparency. Um, and uh, the data table is essentially the same table that sits behind the compare care procedure pricing tool, but we could always enrich it. We could add things that aren't necessarily relevant in a consumer facing tool, but that would be relevant to a researcher or to another organization grabbing this larger data file. In terms of the file itself, it's more than 200,000 rows of data where each row is a specific price paid by a specific insurer um, for a, to a specific provider for a specific procedure um, across 295 procedures. And there's about um, uh, just under 300 procedures are included and about 30,000 providers are captured in that uh, table of data. So it's, it's pretty extensive. Although it's only the 295 outpacing procedures, we estimate it's about 70% of encounters in the healthcare system because it includes office visits, x-rays, MRIs, common screenings, and, and uh, uh, imaging procedures. So just to take a look, a quick look at a couple of, um, we created a very simple dashboard that lets you look at the data um, and see sort of the potential of, of what uh, uh, releasing this makes possible. I, I want to be clear, this is you know, just um, part of it. This just points to the possible we would expect uh, the end user to be putting this to much more sophisticated uses, but um, this gives you a sense of um, rather than the uh, page at a time consumer centric view, this is an example where we took um, a vitamin D3 test. Each column of bubbles, each bubble is uh, a, each column represents a payer's network. Um, you can see the names of the payers across the bottom. Each bubble represents a provider organization. The size of the bubble uh, is a function of how many procedures of that, those procedures they perform, and the height of the bubble, uh, the vertical height, is a function of the price. The price is on the y-axis on the left. So what that, what you see, each column is a, for that procedure, a payer's network, and you're seeing the provider price variation within that payer's network. So for vitamin D tests, you see, and, and the color shading is by provider type. So I think general acute care hospitals are yellow, and clinics um, are red. So what you're seeing is the clinics are uniformly less expensive. You see the variation in the provider's networks. Um, the far right column is not payer specific. It's if you um, rolled it all up into a single um, market-wide uh, multi-payer weighted average, which is relevant um, because our first release of the data, I'll get to this in a future slide, we're going to limit to that um, multi-payer weighted average. For the first release, we do intend and will proceed to release the payer specific um, we think, and, and on some levels, the compare care tool already exposes that data, but we think there's some value in proceeding um, slowly. We've been working very carefully to maintain the trust of the stakeholders. We think that uh, proceeding in a deliberate fashion is more likely to do that than, um, than not. So um, that's an example of if you look at a specific procedure um, and break it out by payers net, uh, by payer. This is a wide field of view. Um, this is all 295 procedures um, arranged, uh, arranged across the bottom. Uh, the x-axis. On the y-axis, it's the prices, but it's been converted from actual prices and disease scores. So what you're seeing is variation um, uh, measured in stand uh, standard deviations. So uh, in most social science data, you would expect things to be within one or two with standard deviations of the, uh, the line, which is you know, the barely visible uh, black line in the center of the, of the data there. What you instead see is absolutely massive price variation um, of 10, 12, 15, 18, 20 um, standard deviations. And that isn't necessarily bad um, because certainly one of the things we learned in talking to the payers about this data is that one of their concerns, they uh, want us to develop metrics that um, combine utilization with price because they do believe that there are certain providers that do a better job of keeping patients, for instance, out of the hospital. Uh, they would rather pay them more. So higher price does not necessarily correlate with um, more, you know, sort of a worse value. I mean, we should be very careful when looking at data like this to understand what it does represent and what it doesn't. But what it does show, and it is a picture of price variation, the color coding is also interesting because it shows provider uh, organization type. And once again, in the center set of prices, that's all um, uh, imaging and blood, uh, blood, or, sorry, 
sorry, blood tests, all types of things. And what you see is the um, clinics are uh, consistently below the average price point. Um, anyway, so that's the, just an example of the last slide and this one of what's possible if you release the data in bulk. And so what uh, Chia is preparing to do are in the final stages of um, finalizing a strategy document that over that, you know, summarizes our, um, our plans, how we're going to handle the rollout, um, things like that. We're getting ready to publish that, and then um, four weeks or thereabouts afterwards, we will actually release the data on our website. Um, the document will also talk about um, our plans for the future in terms of enhancing it with the other procedure types, the pharmacy data, eventually things like mass health and uh, Medicare. That's an example of where a consumer-facing tool like Compare Care, there's no real meaning for saying for having mass health prices in there because for a consumer there are no mass health prices. But if you're trying to shine a light on price variation in the market um, and understanding what providers are getting paid, well, then certainly what they're being paid by mass health is relevant um, as well as what they're being paid by commercial plans. So we want future releases of this. It may not show up in the consumer-facing site, but certainly the big transparency uh, data set that we would want to include it. This is really exciting. Uh, just go off on the limb here for a second. There's an opportunity here, which would be if you could work in a systematic way with evaluators to release these data not all at once, but time by way systematically, it, it might be a chance to observe whether there is an effect of the availability of this data on behaviors. Right. You'd have to do it systematically, right? You can take a random sample of 300 procedures. I mean, we're very happy to do it, you know, to work with the HPC in designing how we approach our transparency agenda. Sure. I mean, we are, I think, very close to release on this first tranche, and so we have to think about what that means, but there's unreleased, um, there's other outpatient procedures we haven't touched yet. There's a bunch of things coming down the pipe that we could apply that approach. And, and one of the, the issues that, that Ray and Chia have been thinking about and interested in looking thoughts on this is what does it mean for market competitiveness to make all of this data readily available where there is price variation? Does this lead to all votes uh, rising or does this create an opportunity for greater competition that may um, actually help uh, bring down some of the spending? Um, and so, you know, um, this will be an interesting experiment in some ways around really having this granular level of price data available in this type of data. Um, and, and there is concerns, I think it's fair to say there are concerns that this will lead to, you know, some competitive pressure where people will say, I now I know what my competitors do with price experiments that they have. Uh, I recommend not listening to vote here because if this is done in a methodical way, a lot of the is done is uh, too much. I have a question. I know that you know you mentioned that ten states have consumer price information now, but my sense is that there has not been robust use by consumers of any of them. Are there any best practices out there? Have you thought about what we can do to follow up Ron's question to get the public more aware and using all of these tools? Um, I think the best shot we have. Um, once again, I think maintaining credibility with the stakeholders. Like, I think if we have a tool that gives people meaningful information that they should have when they're getting ready to have a procedure, I think nothing could be better than a doctor saying to a patient, like, you need to have you know, X done by the way here's the website that has really good information. You know, I think if we actually get the payers and providers referencing us, I think that would be the ultimate success mm -hmm. strategy. I'm not sure in other states, I think it's often done at the regulatory, it's something that's done to the delivery system that we sort of hit them with transparency. Yeah. Um, we're trying to take the approach that it's a collaborative, we're trying to create a transparent ecosystem. So I think our hopes for success hinge on that type of, of that general approach. Mm -hmm. um, just to we'll see. Just to combine um, Rick's comment with Don's comment, it may be that an organization like the GNC would be very interested in really pushing use of something like this to its members in a way of trying to get them to get good, less expensive providers. So it's possible to do a tool specific to GNC or something. Terms of encouraging use of bots and seeing how that affects the weird 
issues go. And I know that GIC is obviously always interested in everybody mm -hmm. that's up here. Really I think it, we completely support, as, as we've been working on this, the, the directive from the legislature was that we would create essentially a shopping tool. And that's what we thought as we went down this path. But we become increasingly convinced that if it's really shopping that you're doing, that that almost has to be done at your health plan. Um, really, only they can show you the out-of-pocket costs that you're going to experience, which is an absolutely core part of the shopping decision. But also, they have the incentives to offer incentives. Like, like we can't give you $100 off if you go to the lower-priced uh, MRI provider, whereas health plans literally do have those sorts of incentive programs. So um, I think we, we are talking to the GIC and the connector and others about how our data can be useful. Um, but I don't know that we can be the tip of the spear when it comes to the actual shopping decision. I think we have to be in a support role. We are interested in and we're talking to those organizations about how our data can illuminate upstream decisions, like what choice of plan to have, what type of coverage, what you know, what primary care provider to go to. We think by the time we get down to choosing a procedure, um, our data is important, but it may not drive the decision. Okay. I, I, sorry, sorry. From a competitive standpoint, I believe adding the quality data becomes critical in valuing the price because as a consumer, I may see the lower price and I immediately assume the lower quality. By having that quality standard, I think it does place competitive pressures on everybody. Also, again, looking at it as a consumer, I think in general, people will trust this site more than the insurer. Uh, people don't really understand self insurance and all of that. And looking at that, it can actually improve the benefit overall decision making where they don't feel they're being pushed in one direction or another. So I think the site becomes critically important. And again, it's visibility. I'm not sure the other 10 states have done a very effective job in making people aware of what's there. Yeah. I understand what you have to go through politically to get everybody on, on the same game. But I think this is a very important product mm -hmm. that people should to be aware of so that they can have access to it. Absolutely. Two other quick thoughts. I wouldn't discount the Potential role of primary care physicians and nurses as uh, as as advocates on the side of uh, transparency here. I think there, there are another part. Uh, there's uh, often they're going to be a, they're sort of intermediate purchaser. Who may be very interested in perhaps not the patients out of pocket. To to, to uh, Rick's question about the science, there is quite a bit of good research on how to show information to consumers and ensure that patients are aware of it due to the giver. Or health sciences universities, the meeting of SWR, I know that you would certainly possibly reach out to people and ask them for further guidance on display and marketing. Absolutely. But I also want to be clear that one of the reasons we're taking the big transparency approach is that um, just as the National Weather Service leverages its unique power as a government agency to collect data, but then releases it and lets other people commercialize it, monetize it, and come up with creative, innovative uses of it, she is in a unique position to collect data. But the reason we're doing the big transparency releases. I got to believe, and we're also having a data science competition um, to mark the release of data. There's got to be some private sector folks that can, and people in academia that can do some really amazingly creative stuff with this. I think putting us, we want to be more like a safety net that sort of you can always come to us and get the data and find out about the data, but I'd love to see what other people can do with it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to show just the last slide on the 2018 meetings and contact information. So the next meeting of our committee is Wednesday, October 3rd. Well, by Wednesday, November 28th. And we have a board meeting coming up on July 18th. So that's the third. We will have a preliminary cost of market impact review to discuss that. And then we meet again in September and December thereafter. Unless I mentioned anything else.
We have one. No, I know. I was in my face. Up at the table, and yeah, just in front of each mic. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I should have realized you were I was going to talk about it. Yes, you got your right. Yep, you don't mind. Probably over the road. Hey, I'm going to see you. Oh, All right. Oh, great. <laughs> hey, how's it going, Commissioner Lord? All right, can I hear you? Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just start with hello. Oh, it's fine. Thank you. I didn't turn it off. About halfway through the meeting, I realized that there was trouble shooting around. Yeah. I got it. Thank you, though. Um, I'm assuming Ellie's grabbing public decks. I don't know. Yeah, thank you.
right now is working on three different work streams. Um, I would say that they are on a different track in terms of timing. I think um, most relevant to Pulse is probably um, it's some thinking around how do we enhance um, and our health information exchange uh, and how can we do so in a way that really promotes a competitive market for digital health companies. So I'd say in terms of timing, um, we are still processing these, the, the initial thinking with stakeholders and um, as far as timing, we're probably looking at recommendations being finalized in early to mid fall. So definitely more to come on that. But I'd say that the the whatever proposals come out of that council um, will be in tandem with Pulse because Pulse will be there working with these digital health startups to, to, to identify ways to get into the market and um, really promote this initiative. Great. Thank you very much. I think we want to speak out of turn with making commitments about the digital health council. But and the point being that it is very aligned, sort of a collaboration between the health policy commission and Pulse is aligned with the work that the government's digital health council is doing. Um, uh, Secretary Ash um, of Economic Development made a commitment two years ago um, for uh, a, up to a million dollars over three years of funding. That has been administered through NEHI. Um, and last year, NEHI, in conjunction with the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, issued a challenge area around aging in place. And so Pulse then sourced digital health startups that are working on aging in place, um, and the Executive Office of, of Elder Affairs partnered with these startups to mentor them and think about uh, testing their products with the services that EOBA provides, such as aging service access points. Um, so we uh, um, had looked at that collaboration and thought it was really interesting and, and thought about um, you know, what a collaboration between HBC and Pulse could do. And I think the, the overarching philosophy is that Pulse and kind of the digital health ecosystem or economy um, is really being driven by academic medical centers, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, and um, it has been you know, inaccessible, for lack of a better term, to more community-based providers who lack the resources um, to uh, be able to innovate and test these digital health startups' products um, you know, because they don't have a, an innovation team, for example. Um, and so we thought this might be a unique opportunity for us to provide some support to Pulse, issue a challenge area of our own that would be aligned with the goals of our shelf care program. Um, so around, you know, avoidable acute care use, social terms of health, timely access to behavioral health. Um, and and um, as part of this collaboration, allow the awardees through that program to be able to work with digital health companies in a new and different way. Um, and so some details, uh, last week at Pulse's finale event for this cohort, their cohorts were in January through June of each year, um, David made uh, a commitment to Pulse um, of around $170,000. Um, we are uh, at the very early phases of this process um, and uh, working out what this relationship would look like. So we're really excited to come back in the fall um, and, and share more about this collaboration. But in just, as I said, we're, we're able to issue a challenge area um, as, as being a champion in this program. Um, and importantly, we're able to kind of bridge this divide between the digital health ecosystem and Massachusetts community-based providers. Um, and through this relationship, Pulse would uh, potentially create a how to guide or a, um, an implementation guide um, for startups who want to work with community-based providers in Massachusetts, because that's very different than working with a matchup like medical center or a pharmaceutical company. Um, and we think there's great value in doing that. Any questions about that collaboration? Great. All right. So I will turn it over to Lois and Secretary um, Salas. regulations that the board uh, approved uh, at the last meeting to release um, for public comment um, in a hearing. Um, as you recall, um, our obligation here is to establish requirements for both an internal appeals process for risk bearing provider organizations and HPC certified accountable care organizations and also to um, establish an external review process um, to obtain third-party reviews of, of issues um, as between patients of those organizations um, and uh, 
decisions that are made by the RBPO or ACO. And as you recall, the statutory requirements there are very similar to um, those that are currently being implemented for carrier appeals by EPP. Just a little bit of a process update here. We have been working on these regulations for some time. We developed interim guidance that we released in April of 2016. And since then, we, would, we have been collecting quarterly reports about the internal uh, appeals process that organizations have been implementing. Um, we've worked with provider organizations trying to understand how that process has um, unfolded and how they've uh, worked and tailored those appeals processes internally um, to address the differences of the provider organizations. We presented a draft of uh, regulations to this committee in February and the board, um, as noted, um, approved the release of proposed regulations in April. Um, we had a public hearing, Commissioner Cohen uh, uh, presided over that hearing on, on May 25th, and we, we had a couple of folks come and, and testify, um, and we received eight written submissions from the organizations you see on this slide. And I guess I'd say overall, um, the, uh, the stakeholders, both from the, the patient um, consumer advocates to the provider organizations as well as health plans, um, really did embrace the framework that we put forward, and um, the, the comments were, were by and large um, offering helpful feedback on, on key areas, um, and so not a wholesale rejection. In fact, one of the, the issues that I was most pleased about is that on the, on the standard for external review, which was the, the issue that we really had to come up with um, basically new, um, in this process, pleasantly surprised that we didn't receive a lot of uh, comment on that. Some some suggestions that it, it should be something closer to medical necessity, but that was really just one provider organization. By and large, all of the other organizations embraced that standard, um, and consumer advocates offered you know, just mild uh, drafting suggestions on that standard. So that, that was um, great to see. I think you know some of the issues are around timing, both with respect to having a later effective date of the regulation, which is something that uh, we can certainly consider um, time frames for the internal, internal process, um, whether it should be calendar days or business days, and, and these are things that we anticipated. Um, and certainly areas for opportunities for clarification, both in terms of the notice requirements um, and uh, more that we can do to describe the clinical reviewers that we will be using the external review agents on describing their, their expertise. Um, but by and large, I think uh, a very sort of manful set of comments that we're, we're working on to analyze. And uh, this is our sort of tentative schedule, which we um, um, previewed with you previously, but um, we are on track um, to be able to come to the board meeting in, in July uh, with the final re uh, regulation and sort of pending uh, timing on the agenda, really, and if, it, if we don't go forward in, in July, it would be in September. And uh, we can, the earliest effective date would be in, in August, but as I mentioned, that's something under consideration in terms of um, the regulation. I, I would just add that I met with Lois last week, and we went over all of the comments uh, from uh, the folks who submitted uh, written testimony, and uh, to her credit, the, the comments were Just of the regulations basically uh, well accepted by those who responded to the comments. So good job. Brad, thank you very much. Um, just to, um, to note that all of, all of the comments are on the website, um, as well as the, the, the language of the proposed regulation, and certainly invite um, commissioner feedback um, between, between now and um, in July, and uh, we would certainly be in advance of any board meeting where we tee this up for approval, uh, summarizing those comments and making recommendations about the changes. Um, do we, yeah, downstream monitor. Absolutely. One of the components, as, as I mentioned, that's ongoing with the interim guidance is that we get reports. So we will, we have been getting reports about the, the number and nature of internal appeals that organizations have been dealing with over the past year and a half. We 
will continue annual reporting, so we will understand the, the numbers and the kinds of appeals. Um, you'll also get information about the types of notices that they're sending out to patients, so there is an ongoing monitoring process. Thank you. Now, I'm going to So, uh, Peter is just going to take this up a little bit. She is the poor, uh, and she's the chair of the. Uh, um, I'm getting ahead of ourselves. We're not quite to a core measures yet. She is the chair of the Quality Alignment Task Force. So she's going to uh, set up this presentation. And then Vivian Jaime, our manager of care delivery innovation and strategic partnerships, um, will go through the presentation. Sure. So over a year ago, last May, um, POHHS convened the Quality Measurement Alignment Task Force uh, with the goal of developing a multiplayer aligned measure set for use in global budget and zero. The task force is made up of representatives from payers, providers, academics, consumer advocates, and a number of state agencies um, with expertise in performance measurement. So I take myself out of that. I am certainly not the quality of this. So through measurement alignment, I think the goal is to really achieve administrative simplification, um, promote population health, and move towards more outcomes measures. Right now, we have which currently uses a lot of process measures, so they could they could really get and push towards the um, outcome studies. So I'm happy to announce today that at this point we have reached consensus um, on some measures which providers and payers in the Commonwealth will be expected to implement in their 2019 contracts on a voluntary basis. Um, and so we are at this point in time we're close to decision on what measures are will be in a core set and then what will be um, Menu measures that peers and providers can choose from. So there will certainly be more to come on this, but um, Vivian is going to provide a little bit more detail on the process to date. Thank you. So last time we presented on this work was in November of 2016, so that was over a year and a half ago. Um, so for those that aren't as familiar with this work, I'll provide just a little bit of background on how we identified this as a policy priority. So for several consecutive years, uh, we heard in pre-filed testimony for the cost trends hearing that uh, uh, there was significant reporting burden, excuse me, on providers and payers due to the proliferation of quality measures, um, particularly in recent years. And for local budget alternative payment model contracts um, across Medicare, Mass Health, and commercial payers, we found that there were 106 uh, measures in use, and even Dr. Berwick, I think, would agree that that's a pretty large number of, of measures. Um, so this reporting burden we heard from providers contributes to provider burnout. Um, it's costly. The Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association did a survey of its members, and based on the findings of that survey, they estimated that uh, over $67 million statewide is spent on quality measurement and reporting. And in some cases, uh, you know, the variability is due to differences in member populations. For example, Mass Health might have a measure for their LTSS members that, that might not apply to, to commercial populations. But we also found variability just among commercial contracts. And so um, we actually, uh, in May of 2017, we collected data from the three largest commercial payers in the state. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, Massachusetts, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and Tubbs Health Plan. And we asked them to report which measures they use in at least 10 of their contracts. So the graph on this slide um, was taken actually from our January data points issue, which you can find uh, on our website. And um, in this issue, we, we presented our findings, but I'll just go over uh, some of them. So as you can see from this uh, graph, 64 measures are included in at least 10 contracts across the commercial payers in Massachusetts. And of those, 17 measures are, are used by all three payers, but 29 measures are used by only one payer. You can also see that about half of the measures are process measures, as Under Secretary Peters mentioned. And what we mean by process measures are measures that are usually derived from claims uh, data and um, describe, you know, did the screening happen versus outcome measures, which look at, you know, patient outcomes over time and are derived from patient charts and we see a much smaller number of, of outcome measures. Um, so there's interest in both aligning the measures to achieve administrative simplification and also in moving more towards population-based and outcomes-based measures. I will add one piece of color commentary as I 
which the outcome measures are more aligned with the process measures um, today, uh, which is interesting considering the burden of clinical data that needs to be reported um, into each payer and sort of you know brings home this point that providers are reporting in on similar measures, but in multiple different ways to each payer, um, which contributes to the resource burden and the administrative simplification opportunity. Um, so as Undersecretary Peters mentioned, in the spring of 2017, uh, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services convened the Quality Measure Alignment Task Force with representatives from provider, payer, consumer, <coughs> advocate, and academic communities with expertise in healthcare quality measurement. Um, EHS also engaged Michael Baylor as a task force facilitator who had ample experience doing this work in other states and actually is now working in Oregon and really brought a lot of value. To this, to this process given his experience doing this. Um, so the, the task force had a couple of, of, of key goals. The first is to develop a multi-payer aligned measure set for use in ACO contracts beginning in 2019. And that represents the first phase of this work, which we are close to completion. Um, and then the second goal is to identify where current measure gaps exist and develop a strategy to address them. So throughout the process of uh, review of transgenic measures, we've begun to identify, or the task force has begun to identify um, some, some areas where measure gaps exist and will really begin the process of, of gap filling in the next phase of this work. Uh, there's also a subgroup of task force members that form the district subcommittee. So it's composed of 12 uh, members from the task force that met separately to advise MassHealth on the implementation of the quality component of their ACO and CP programs. And, uh, you know, MassHealth reduced the list of measures from the ACO program from 39 to 22 in part uh, due to the input from this subcommittee. And the subcommittee also advised MassHealth in formulating measure definitions, proposing benchmark approaches, and informing the selection and design of patient experience survey tools. So this next slide um, just shows the composition of task force participants and the ones with asterisks are um, also part of the subcommittee. As you can see, there are a number of medical and behavioral health providers represented, a few academic measurement experts, um, two consumer advocates, and a combination of public and private payers. There are also nine state agencies that are represented on the task force. I'll just walk through um, the process uh, that the task force has, has, has gone through over the last uh, year. So in the first couple of meetings, uh, they describe the current landscape. So what is the state of quality measure alignment in Massachusetts? Um, and, and really agreed on what the goals of the task force would be. So specifically to, to achieve a multi-payer aligned set for use in global budget contracts. That was, that, that was the parameters um, of their work. They also agreed on a set of guiding principles, which I will cover in the next slide, um, that really you know, informed their, their process of reviewing these measures and, and which ones would be endorsed by the task force. The majority of the meetings, um, the task force meant to review actual candidate measures, and, and throughout, as I mentioned, they identified measure gaps. More recently, um, the task force has been engaged in the second task review of measures and uh, resolving the question of poor menu, as you know, um, you know there was a, a vote in favor of a poor and menu approach. So poor measures, just to be clear, are measures that all payers and ACOs are expected to use in their contracts, whereas menu measures are measures from which payers and ACOs are able to choose. And so, you know, as opposed to a menu only approach where we might not have any measures collected across all contracts, in a poor and menu approach, we'll have at least a handful of measures that, that we can assess throughout the process system. Um, and then, you know, the next the next phase uh, of this work or the next couple of meetings um, will begin planning for the implementation of the measure set as well as discussing the process for the maintenance of the measure set. So whether there will be an annual meeting of the task force to, um, you know, agree on you know, if, if any measures need to be retired or if any new measures need to be added to the, to the set. I think there is... Um, it, it's been a lot of work. So this task force has met more or less every two weeks um, for over a year now. It's a huge time commitment of the folks that we ask to come to these meetings. And um, they've really engaged. We've, we've kind of stacked it with more payers on purpose because we want them to adopt this. 
it is voluntary, um, and that and, and this is you know we think that this is going to be the most effective way to make this change in the market is a consensus building process. Um, and I will say at the beginning of the process it, was, it, it seemed rocky, <laughs> um, but in the end, as Lauren said, we we got everybody uh, to have a consensus vote. Not everybody voted yes, um, but there was a consensus vote to move forward this you know this menu set with a four that will be required in every contract uh, between a, a commercial and Medicaid payer um, and an ACO. We are statistically feasible. Obviously, some of the measures you know, may not have the denominator to do it on, but um, you know, in, in my opinion, that's a, this is a huge win that, that payers and providers and consumers um, and state agencies and, and importantly purchasers like the GIT have, have come to the table and, and, and gone through this consensus-driven voluntary process where nobody on their own volition and they wanted to participate in it. Um, and so I'm, you know, started out rocky, but happy, happy with how this, trust the process was sort of the, the internal um, motto. Um, and, I, and I think it, it's worked so far. <coughs> So in this next slide, we sort of outlined what the guiding principles were. There were a set of principles that were applied to individual measures and then a set of principles that were applied to the measure set as a whole. I won't go through each of them, but I will say that um, the task force members had the, the guiding principles printed out at every meeting to, to reference you know, as they made decisions on, on whether or not to endorse candidate measures. And, and they've also, um, Michael Bailey and his team used the buying value tool developed by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to score the measures against the guiding principles. And so if any of the measures you know, scored particularly low, they might reconsider their, their endorsement of that measure. So having that objective tool was really valuable, and having this set of guiding principles to, re to return to um, also seemed very valuable. Um, and, and to be clear, measures do not need to satisfy all of the guiding principles in order to be selected. So um, as Undersecretary Peters mentioned, the task force reviewed over 150 measures and endorsed 25 measures. Um, this was at the last meeting on June 5th. Um, so this is a, a big accomplishment um, after a year of, of work. And as Katie mentioned, many meetings, I think initially we thought they'd be monthly meetings and the task force has met twice a month. So it's really um, a lot, it's been a lot of work to, to get to this point. Um, also, um, eight measures were placed on a monitoring set. So these are measures which will not um, have payment tied to performance, but for which performance will be tracked, mainly because um, they're tapped out measures. So measures for which performance is already high, so, so there was less room for improvement than some of the other measures that were selected. And then um, also some measures were placed on this developmental category, which is, a uh, you know, measure concepts that will be addressed in the next phase of this work. So, you know, the task force may look at the, the measures specifically that, that have been identified that are interesting or, or look at the measure concept or domain um, of that measure and see whether there's other measures worth exploring. So this slide um, show, shows the endorsed measures by domain. And as you can see, there's a balance of measures in the prevention and early detection category as well as the chronic conditions um, category. Um, there are also a number of behavioral health measures, and we just dip this into measures for physical health conditions. Um, and a number of, of measure concepts have been identified for the next phase of this work, oral health, equity, social determinants of health, integration. Um, also worth noting, although not um, included in this slide, a majority of the endorsed measures apply to pediatric populations. And uh, the task force also made the decision to not um, review acute care measures. So I think you may see some gaps in this grid, you know, zero and maternity care notably. Um, that is because we did not include acute care measures. We only included ambulatory measures in the task force to review. So why was there zero on equity and social determinants of health? So I mean, as I as I mentioned, um, there they were placed in the developmental category. So that means these measures may not have been validated and at, at a national level, not not ready for for contracts, but they were important measure concepts that were a priority for the Commonwealth. And so um, there was a commitment to exploring uh, those those measures in the next phase of this work, and hopefully they'll be included in uh, the future, future set. And on equity, um, we had a, a great 
philosophical debate about whether you take the existing 25 measures and you stratify them by subpopulations, um, or, or you have a sort of specific equity quality measure, and the group um, landed on the stratification approach rather than sort of an equity specific measure. Um, you know, that's to say that we need to have the data to be able to stratify these measures by, um, by certain disparity subpopulation, but um, it got too cumbersome to think of all the different subpopulations. You know, the PDS is on the table, advocate for them. Um, you know, uh, there were there was a disparity as academic expert who was, you know, we're thinking of all sorts of different race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, food insecurity, like the list could go on and on. And what are the what are the high priority areas for equity for the Commonwealth? Um, I think landed on where possible being able to stratify. Vivian said a majority or pediatric of the 25 that are endorsed? No, no, a number of high to pediatric population. So, no. so the, uh, an adolescent or children. <clears throat> but there is a notable group of pediatric measures um, kind of universally beyond the well child. Um, so, as I mentioned at the next meeting in uh, June 19th, the task task force will hopefully uh, reach consensus on the core measure set. After that, the task force facilitator will prepare a preliminary report uh, describing the work of the task force, the set of measures endorsed by the task force, and the sum of recommendations. And there will then be an opportunity for public comment, hopefully uh, in the late summer, uh, prior to finalizing that report. And after that point in the fall, uh, the task force will then begin the second phase of that have this work begin gap filling and, and coordinating efforts around testing developmental measures. So I'll open it up for so you said this was voluntary? My client is voluntary. And I'm just wondering sort of how do we think about that as we rethink our ACO grades and whether are we moving to incorporation of at least the four data sets? I think we we have talked a couple of times about having a performance based component to ACO certification in the future. Um, the real rate limiter is what I mentioned before is that we don't have clinical data um, at the Health Policy Commission, um, and and so it would be very complicated to think about how we would collect and analyze that data on an ACO level. Um, you know, I know that there are efforts underway to kind of think about think about that um, on behalf of the governor's digital health. Council, um, but I think that's practically challenging. That I think we would love there to be a performance-based component to ACO certification in the next go around. We just have to do a little bit more thinking about what that looks like. You know, with regards to the voluntary process, it, it, that is how we set it up. Um, and uh, you know, I will say that some of the no votes came from payers. Um, and so, you know, I think that uh, being able to kind of issue this report, uh, give some public transparency around this process. Um, and then some public transparency around adoption of the measure set in 2019 and what's even feasible and not feasible, which payers are or are not doing it, and having some transparency around that next year, I think will put us in a really good place from a policy perspective to think about what's the right, right um, thing to do going forward. Uh, yeah, thanks for this work. Uh, do you think that maybe the measure set is going to be strong enough that commercial payers might decide to use it generally, not just for ACO populations? Ideally, I, I think we have really focused on those contracts um, because that's where the most money is um, from a health plan perspective. But um, there was a real tension between PETAS measures and NCQA accreditation on behalf of payers and, and sort of ACO quality and, and contractual measures. And, and Payers have been beholden to these CETAS measures and NCQA for a long time, and it's really strategic and important for them. CETAS measures are really limiting. <laughs> um, and, and so I think that's that was a lot of the tension that we experienced. Great question. I think this is great work. I, I remember my first prospects hearing that someone said, Why can't we have one simple set of measures? So clearly. So, Parkman and Kathleen uh, Harrison and Kelsey Brinkman um, are going to come up and if you want to backtrack on the slides, and everyone else. Um, that, 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 
So this is an update on our uh, image planning strategy and some recommendations going forward. Yes, exactly. Good morning, commissioners. So um, over the next about 30 minutes or so, we're hoping to have a discussion with you about the current status of our PCMH certification program called PCMH Prime and put forward a recommendation to you to update the program and really take it forward into the future. As you know, the current program requires that primary care practices seeking certification achieve the National Committee for Quality Assurance's PCMH recognition program and also meet a set of HPC developed behavioral health integration capabilities or criteria. And those capabilities were developed by the HPC back in 2015. So since then, some things have changed. We've obviously developed a lot more experience with the program. The landscape has also evolved, and importantly, NCQA's expectations for primary care practices with regard to their BHI capabilities have also changed. The first practices that achieved PCMH Prime certification um, will be up for renewal um, in the spring of 2019. And we're also at an inflection point in our relationship with NCQA as we're nearing the end of our original contract term with them. So for a variety of reasons, it's been feeling like it's the right time to think about where we are with PCMH Prime and what we want to do going forward. So what we're going to recommend to you today is that we advance the program um, by moving away from having our own HPC specific set of standards and instead adopting a set of criteria that are reflected in NCQA's new um, behavioral health integration distinction program. So that would include a new set of standards for what it means to be um, an HPC certified primary care medical home, patient centered medical home, um, as well as a new process for applying. So we'll, and, and we think there are good um, policy and operational reasons um, to make this kind of change. So we're going to talk about both of those factors today. Kelsey's going to um, take over in a minute. She's going to kind of give you an update on where we are with the program, set the landscape a little bit, give you some sense of the factors that we've been thinking about and considering, um, and then we'll get into the meat of the recommendation and you know really look to engage and have some discussion with you there. So um, before we get into the, the meat of our recommendation, I'm just going to provide a short program update, um, just to give you some context for, for where we are with the program. <clears throat> Currently, we have 97 uh, slide. We have 97 practices participating in PCMH Prime, 79 that are PCMH Prime certified, 17 on the pathway to Prime, uh, and one uh, planning to apply to NCQA PCMH and PCMH Prime concurrently. Um, we'll look at participation here just a little differently. Uh, in terms of physician uh, participation rates, 11% uh, of Massachusetts physicians practice in a site participating in PCMH Prime. Um, that's 9% uh, in certified sites and 9% in sites on the pathway to Prime. So, um, on this slide, uh, this describes the percent of practices that submitted a PCMH Prime survey to NCQA uh, that meet each of our 13 PCMH Prime criteria. So what we see here, see here is that there is a good deal of variation uh, in which criteria PCMH Prime applicants choose to adopt. Um, you know, it does suggest that some of our criteria, our current criteria, are more challenging to, to meet than others. So uh, as you all know, um, we continue to you know, partner pretty closely with NCQA to, to run this program. Um, and as part of that, um, NCQA puts on regular training us, both on the PCMH recognition program uh, and our PCMH prime program. Uh, we've held uh, 14 of those trainings over the past few years, um, and we generally uh, continue to receive positive feedback on, on these trainings. So, um, as we begin, I uh, get ready to talk about you know, the future of the program. Uh, I do think it's worthwhile to you know, kind of pause and reflect uh, on where we've been with the PCMH prime program uh, and some key milestones uh, to date. So, you know, of course, the program in January 2016. Uh, and overall, that first year, um, we put a lot of work into really just setting up, launching, and operationalizing the program. Uh, you know, building our partnership with NCQA, putting together workflows, uh, setting up our, our initial trainings, um, and of course, certifying our first practices. 
Uh, we also contacted the NCUA to design our, our technical assistance program. Uh, and then in, in 2017, we were able to launch the FTA program uh, with a first cohort of, of kind citizens. Uh, at the end of last year, um, we uh, updated um, our PCMH harm standards to align with NCQA's uh, revised PCMH 2017 standards. Um, and we also uh, redesigned and launched our, our PCA program. So uh, that brings us to today. Um, and as Catherine framed uh, at the beginning, we are now at a point where uh, we really need to think about and make some decisions about where we want to go with the future of this program. Um, and you know, there are three key reasons for this. First, is that our contract with NCQA expires at the end of the month. The second um, is that uh, the first practices to have achieved PCMA crime um, are going to have their three year certification uh, expire in the next year and will be up for uh, certification renewal. And then finally, uh, as we discussed previously, um, because the NCQA has updated its uh, PCMA certification program, uh, including launching a DH distinction module as an add on to that program. Um, and both of these changes, um, the base program and the DH module, have, have operational and, and content implications for, for our prime program. So, uh, for the next few slides, uh, I'm going to provide some, some high level policy background uh, to help frame uh, and provide some more context for, for our PCMA prime recommendations. So, you know, first of all, I think it's important to locate. Um, our PCMH Prime certification responsibility within the context of our overall carry delivery transformation agenda um, and activities. Now, certification programs overall um, and PCMH Prime specifically um, are you know, one tool in, in our toolbox um, in ways that we can support our, our agenda. We also do things like you know, convenings, learning and dissemination, investments, research, et cetera. So, you know, one big strength of our certification program uh, is that it really is an opportunity to lay out a uh, common vision and set common standards for providers to work, for, work towards. Uh, and we think that is a really meaningful and, and important activity. Um, at the same time, you know, PCA crime certification is, is voluntary. Um, and currently, we think you know, the incentives for practices to participate are really more philosophical than, than tangible right now. You know, certainly we offer TA to support practices, um, but we also have specific you know, financial incentives. So, um, these are you know, these opportunities and challenges for things that we really consider deeply uh, and have been weighing as we come to uh, a recommendation for the future of the program. And I think one more thing from my perspective is the decision has important operational impacts on our team because you know we, we spend a certain amount of resources managing and supporting this program, um, and there you know there are a number of things on the care delivery and transformation agenda that we could do, um, and so I think that's just worth considering. Um, in light of more strategic and policy questions about what to do with this program, about what is the most effective lever for the Health Policy Commission um, to drive behavioral health integration for primary care and patient-centered primary care, and, and what is the right level of the health system for us to engage with, because we've, you know, just candidly faced some challenges engaging the, the sort of frontline primary care practice um, cohort, um, and, and have had, you know, more payer engagement and more engagement on the ACO side, which is a, you know, a different level within the, within the health care system. So I think it's just something to think about when um, considering the, the future strategy for this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, here, uh, I've outlined just a few of, oh, sorry. Oh, you may be getting there, just so I don't know. Can you see this through the eyes of the provider? What's going to I think um, maybe wait a couple slides and then we can start really diving into that. I have a couple slides on that. You can certainly go into more detail. Um, so here, um, it listed just a few, you know, key policy and program developments uh, now related to behavioral health integration. Uh, and overall, what we're seeing is, is this continues to be a really important um, policy area, um, both for policymakers in the state, uh, you know, at the federal level and and with NCQA. So, um, you know, kind of going off of that, uh, a really important factor uh, impacting our thinking about the future of crime uh, is NCQA's expanded focus on, on behavioral health integration, um, both with its new PCMA uh, recommendation program uh, or update 
it is using the Britain Jennifer program um, and the distinction in behavioral health module. Um, and so it's really setting a higher bar for behavioral health integration than, than they have in past years. Um, so this slide and, and the next uh, provide an overview of, of NCBA's uh, behavioral health linking module um, and how it compares to, to the current prime program. So uh, as with PCMH prime, uh, behavioral health distinction uh, builds off of the broader PCMH model uh, by requiring uh, NCBA recognition as a prerequisite for distinction. So that's the similarity. Um, on the other hand, uh, a key difference um, you know, is, is the recognition period. Um, while PCMH Prime requires a three-year recognition period, um, this distinction is, is a one-year recognition period. Um, and that's keeping with NCPRA's latest PCMH recognition process. So you know, if we were to adopt this module, we would have to move towards that shorter recognition period um, and require uh, much to submit um, for abbreviated documentation on an annual basis after they submitted kind of one full kind of initial term. So, uh, in terms of uh, content, um, you know, there is a significant overlap between the two programs, um, but the key point is that behavioral health distinction differs from time in that it includes both a higher number of standards uh, and more advanced standards than PCMH prime. Um, there is over a significant overlap between the standards, uh, and in fact, the distinction includes uh, nine of our PCMH criteria, uh, PCMH prime criteria, in, in some way. In addition to those criteria, uh, the distinction also includes many more advanced criteria that we don't currently have in our program. So just as a few examples, um, it focuses on further integrating um, behavioral and mental health plans, uh, monitoring behavioral health symptoms, and adjusting care uh, accordingly over time, um, and establishing uh, quality improvement programs for behavioral health measures. So you know, really the key point is this, this isn't you know, introductory behavioral health, um, and so they really already testing some baseline PCMH capabilities through their PCMH program, um, and the distinction module is really more advanced. So, um, yeah, to say, you know, our recommendation shortly and succinctly, you know, we're recommending that the agency adopt NCPA's distinction in behavioral health integration by spring 2019, uh, and that we contact with NCPA to cover practice application fees and uh, provide training. Um, and there are four key, four key reasons for our recommendation. Uh, the first is really to maintain focus and momentum on behavioral health integration. You know, we've made progress in this area through PCMA Prime, uh, and we think this uh, distinction uh, offers an opportunity for us to continue um, work advancing the market through more challenging standards. Uh, additionally, um, further aligning with NCPA programs and processes provides uh, administrators and location both for the practices um, and also for, for the agency as, as can be obtained. Um, third, uh, you know, covering fees um, and uh, sponsoring, continuing to sponsor some provider trainings um, is relatively low cost, um, and they'll continue to offer some, some supports to providers for, for achieving this NCPA distinction. Um, and similarly, uh, maintaining a relationship with, with NCPA is also important to the agency uh, to be able to receive data on practice performance on uh, on DEH measures, uh, as well as communicate about the program to, to providers. Uh, and then lastly, it's really just about timing. Um, we propose to make no change now uh, so that the new structure of the program is ready by the spring um, when practices begin to be up for, for certification. So um, I will just pause there um, to ask for any kind of initial reaction or questions. I can certainly get I have you know, more slides about operational details. I do have a slide about um, a stakeholder engagement that, that we can begin to speak to, but uh, I'll take a quick pause. I'm just curious, does the one versus three year, do you know what the impact would be budget points? So that is something, um, yes, so I put together a quick estimate. Um, as you all know, NCPA's pricing is somewhat complicated, so <coughs> it's not you know, easy to get a definitive uh, number. It looks like the behavioral health integration module is a bit more expensive than our current PCMH Prime uh, program. Uh, that said, I think it will. There are some opportunities for negotiation with NCQA. You know, they offer often offer discounts to sponsors and that sort of thing. Um, so you know, on the face of it, slightly more expensive, but it will depend a bit on how the operation runs it. So, so is the expense to us? 
So um, what we are proposing is that the NC, is that uh, the HBC uh, continue to cover applications for the HBC cover applications fees for VH to sanction for practices in Massachusetts, like we have been for comment. Uh, sorry about the time sequence, but mm -hmm. in order to get the QA. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on uh, if it's priced by the number of clinicians who in the practice. Um, so there's a wide variation. That I don't know um, off the top of my, my head the, the average. Um, looking from NCQA to like 2014 PCMH program to their 2017 program, you know, they totally changed the pricing structure. It's not obviously more expensive. Um, in the last slide in the appendix, but this doesn't answer your question because it's not on the PCMH program, it's on um, it's on the pricing for PCMH Prime versus yeah. the behavioral health and sanction level. I will say we have heard that um, the the resource intensity of going through PCMH and QA is, is, is intense, both on resources to do it, but also it is a financial investment and some systems um, have told us recently they decided to not do it again because of, because of the cost. So we think if we can allay the cost of of the behavioral health part of it, then, then that could be an effective way of that. Is that yeah. the only barrier they identified between the change of the new system and the cost, or are they all concerned about the one year and the multiple things? Yeah, you have the cost. Um, so, sorry, you mean um, what are the barriers of the current uh, certification practices for, for PCMH in, in general or for PCMH? And why did they move from three years to one year? Yeah, so um, the barriers to PCMH recognition in general is, as Katie was saying, really just administrative burden and probably all the cost you know, as well, you know, their, their time. Um, and really one of the NCQA's goals of their new kind of annual recognition process um, was to alleviate some of those administrative concerns. So the way it used to be was every three years practices undergo a really big resource intensive survey review. Um, the way it is now with annual reporting is they do that, you know, the big review once and then on an annual basis, you know, far abbreviated documentation requirements, um, which is hopefully will be the administrative burden I think you know, remains to be seen, and it's still very new. Um, but that is, that was a, a big goal of NCQA, and they had to continue to, to receive. And in addition to that, I would say that um, in keeping with NCQA's mission to PCMH approach, they've also uh, changed their requirements around exactly what practices have to provide in an effort to be much more flexible. So rather than having a, a very defined set of documents that every practice has to pull together, reports they have to run de novo just for NCQA that they wouldn't otherwise be using in the practice setting. NCQA has said, hey, we understand this is too administrative and burdensome. We don't want practices to be investing so much of their own time in pulling stuff just for us. So their new standards are much more, show us evidence that you say demonstrates that you're doing this and we'll work with you. You know, that's why they've really moved to this annual process. Part of it is that they're having um, sort of virtual reviews now. So it's not just that you mail a bunch of paper in and somebody looks at it in a room and they never talk. It's a, it's a more collaborative approach they've taken which I think has given us um, some additional comfort that um, you know, the fees notwithstanding um, that, that practices on the whole may see a reduction in, in burden by um, the new NCQA approach and, and by extension that we align with them. So now operationally, um, what it would look, you know, in order to adopt, um, to replace our prime standards, the VH distinction standard. Um, we propose um, maintaining a long term contract with NCQA. Um, and this is needed in order so that we can cover those distinction application fees, as I said, uh, and will also allow us to, to receive data for NCQA uh, on practice performance, which we think is really valuable to us, um, as well as sponsor some trainings on that distinction. We do recommend discontinuing payments for, for marketing um, to NCQA. Uh, this is because um, they're the ones who own the VH extension program, so they are doing some marketing in this area. Um, and then lastly, you know, another advantage of, uh, of this recommendation is that because NCQA owns the VH extension standard and it's really fully their program, uh, we won't need to pay them the fees to measure development. So in terms of our recommended approach to, to trainings, 
uh, we recommend uh, sponsoring webinars uh, going forward um, that cover uh, you know, the DH distinction criteria and the application process for that program, uh, but ending, ending our sponsorship of in-person seminars on the PCMA transition. Um, and we recommend this because we think uh, you know, currently NCQA doesn't offer standalone trainings for the DH distinction, and we think that's something that really is necessary if you want um, you know, widespread adoption of the standard that information needs to be out there. Um, in terms of the PCA seminars, um, those, you know, they're more on the expensive side, uh, certainly than the webinars, um, and, you know, they focus on the base PCMH model, and so we think, you know, our, our dollars would perhaps be better spent elsewhere um, you know, in achieving our, our policy goals. So, um, you know, in, in making this recommendation, uh, we reached out to a number of stakeholders uh, to get feedback um, on the new DH distinction standards. Also, if you're interested in exactly what the standards are, they're in the appendix. Yeah. So um, we reached out to a subset uh, of PCMH Prime certified practices uh, to get their feedback on the standards, uh, including uh, two community health centers, uh, a large integrated health system, uh, and representatives from a group of smaller uh, and more decentralized practices. Uh, no, and overall, uh, I say we, we received a variety of, of different reactions from practices on, on the standards. Um, one thing that was very good to hear uh, was that, generally speaking, you know, practices agreed that these standards uh, appropriately describe you know, high-value, you know, evidence-based behavioral health care. Uh, in terms of feasibility, you know, we did receive more mixed reactions. Uh, some practices, you know, said they are already implementing you know, many, if not all, of the standards uh, described in the behavioral health system. <coughs> uh, and some of them even suggested areas where the HPC or NCQA could go even further. Uh, to promote behavioral health. On the other hand, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, practices also pointed out uh, specific criteria that would be more challenging for them to meet. Um, you know, honestly, some practices were, were very frank and upfront that if we implemented this today, you know, they wouldn't be able to meet a uh, behavioral health distinction. So, um, you know, I think that the big takeaway here um, is that, you know, uh, you know, this is kind of the challenge of implementing a program um, for practices with a variety of, of behavioral health capabilities. Um, you know, we think if we implemented these standards, uh, we would likely have less practices that can be done than it would if we maintain our current standards. Uh, and I think I think this is largely to be expected for, for a program that aims to you know uh, support more challenging standards and push the market for more advanced behavioral health care. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to kind of uh, our discussion at, at the beginning um, uh, of the section about, you know, our, our care delivery transformation as a whole, um, we think we have other policy levers where we can kind of continue to push our, our behavioral health agenda. Um, so um, our, we think there's a lot of opportunity here uh, in our ACO certification program um, where we can begin to kind of hold, hold systems accountable for behavioral health integration. Uh, as opposed to just focusing on the individual practices uh, as the DC Prime program has, has historically done. Thoughts by the commissioners? Uh, if we move to the standard of this new process, how would the role of the HPC change mm -hmm. in this case? Yeah, that's a good um, Question. So, uh, in terms of operations, um, you know, right now, we're, NCQA has always you know, reviewed documentation um, and then sent a report to APC for us to make the final determination. If we were to do this, you know, this is NCQA's program, so it would be more uh, in NCQA's court. Um, we would no longer you know, have, have as much say. We would have, you know, say, in the individual standards. I mean, we would not make that final determination about whether practices would achieve the distinction. I think, you know, on the whole, I would say that moving toward this model um, frees up some resources um, at the HBC for redeployment to focusing on similar topics in ACO certification and in the rest of our policy agenda. I think um, there's going to be administrative simplification both for practices and for us um, in, in going forward with this kind of alignment. The real, I don't, I don't know, I think saying cost is, is maybe um, too big, but but the it, it has taken significant resources for our team um, by virtue of having our own specific set of standards that are similar to NCQA's but not exactly the same. 
that's been the place where I think we've burned some administrative resources. Um, every time NCQA makes a change, we have to kind of tweak around the edges. What are we doing? Um, they have to maintain a particular separate application module in their system that speaks to our program. So, you know, we've begun to feel like, how do we, how, how can we streamline this a little bit and then, you know, continue to advance our, our behavioral health agenda through other means? I would also add, I think one of the things we're thinking about is, is there still a, a seal and a brand that goes with us from the Health Policy Commission? And we do think that that's, that's probably something we would want to maintain for these practices to say, if you meet this, this BHI distinction, you are HPC certified, NASA certified, HPC certified. That still, I think, would want to have some meaning attached to it, even if it's now deemed by this, this new more national standard. And that is consistent. Some other states do have their, their own states PCMH certification seals and branding, but then tie it directly back to us. Uh, this is a good idea. The, the NCQA is very trustworthy and solid, and you know, we're affiliating them with a, with a really good alternative way to serve. But I was a big question I can answer that one because I can't, I'm not sure what it is, but it's that. Uh, so uh, as important as behavioral health is, and it's crucial, and I'm really glad to see us moving on our, our interest in the quality of, of ACOs is very broad. It has to do with performance across a whole range of, of characteristics. You know, what we're doing here is delegating a particular piece of it, which is fine, and we're subsidizing it, and we pay for it. Does this, is, is there any balance issue here? What about the rest of the performance of ACOs? Are we, Somehow, um, over investing, be careful the way I say this, over investing the behavioral health component of it compared to the total performance of the ACO? Or is it actually free resources for us to look at other performance structures? I'll start and then, and then Katie will, will um, add, correct, revise. Um, so I think the way I see it is. Um, we are still uh, primarily focused in, in the PCMH certification program on the, the primary care unit and what is primary care doing with behavioral health. When we talk about what is the, what is the ACO opportunity here, what I think about is that primary care practice that has made some advances in behavioral health integration, perhaps as a result of PCMH Prime. You know, now they have some better referral system. They may have a provider within the practice who's able to do brief intervention. They do more screening. But a barrier for that practice is going to the next level and perhaps achieving some of these more advanced standards that are present in the behavioral health distinction module. And so when we talk about leveraging the ACO in this picture, what I think about is encouraging ACOs to support primary care to continue to advance its capabilities. So. I would think of it as, and, and of course, then also holding the ACO accountable for a, a much broader range of other kinds of performance outcomes as well, not just behavioral health, but, but, but um, you know, using our ACO certification program in a new way to put, to, 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 to put ACOs on the hook for doing some investment in primary care in this space. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's great. So forget the ACO, let's go to the primary care unit for a minute. Absolutely, behavioral health is an important issue. We need to work on it. But if I had to say the characteristic of an excellent primary care system, behavioral health is on the list, but also would be extremely wonderful coordination of care for chronic ill people across multiple specialties. Forget behavioral health. Or another would be we just looked at overuse of unnecessary care. Another would be the way primary care begins to reconsider and take control of low value care. So I think I, those I are considered in the NCQA PCMH based certification. So whether they're considered enough to meet our needs is you know is another question. But the base NCQA PCMH recognition, particularly level three, which is most of our providers, looks at IT infrastructure, looks at care coordination infrastructure, looks at performance measurement and improvement infrastructure, um, patient and family engagement, um, things like that. And so I I think you know. Way back in the day, that was also prior to my time. You know, folks at, on the commission zoomed in on behavioral health as a deficit in those standards. Well, meanwhile, sort of the rest of what we want to make primary care become 
was was fairly well represented in NCQA's base PCMH recognition. Right. Whether, whether that holds water to an expert like you, I, I don't know, but um, that was our that was our, our thought process. So so this amounts to a thorough delegation of the surveillance of the quality of the primary care unit to NCQA. And its standards. And its standards yes. go. Well, uh, okay, I guess I just say let's keep the skeptical eye on that. I'm glad we're meeting in a paper help. I really doubt that's the only area that we have some teaching term. And we should be looking, you know, get special human priorities to establish in the Commonwealth. So, uh, how, how good are they in oral health? How good are they in some of the other um, uh, things that we've come to care about in the Commonwealth? Maybe, it, maybe it's fine. It probably is, but, but I just really urge I, I think Don's points are, are well taken. Um, I think we still are not there on the area of integration, which led us to this sort of certification in the first place. Um, I, I, I would just note a couple of things. One, I think this is a case where we were up front of NCQA, and so we should give credit to the HBC for moving this uh, forward and really having an impact on national policy beyond uh, Massachusetts and the fact that. CQA has now developed a behavioral health distinction uh, is, uh, is speaks to that uh, quality of that work. Um, I think this makes a lot of sense because I worry about having a static set of uh, standards and uh, those would get old and while the rest of the field is advancing and so we would require continuing work on our part to keep those standards fresh and NCQA does that for a living and you want to suppose their, their skills uh, and expertise. And I think to the point that's been made, there's an opportunity to use our uh, staff resources and our technical assistance resources in a variety of other ways, not only to continue to deal with behavioral health, but to deal with all of the other issues that, that uh, John uh, has raised as well. So I, I, I like the direction here. Um, I guess my question was, what do you need from us or from, from the commission? Yeah, we, we don't need anything concretely today. It was just meant to be a dialogue, and, and thank you so much for engaging in this conversation. Um, we will be back in the fall with um, some things that go today. Right? Yeah, yeah okay. we also wanted to make this public, too, yeah. sure. and so yeah. we have a much broader audience of how we can get more feedback. Yeah, so if anybody else has feedback, <laughs> <laughs> um, please reach out. So the last agenda item, uh, Kathy Connolly, Director of Strategic Investment and Dave Malasaptic, uh, Senior Program Manager on the SHARP, SHARP program, I, I, and then the Shift Care program, the SHARP Shift Care, um, you know, some sort of merged acronym, um, uh, will be giving us an update about the SHARP playbook, which is um, a deliverable that will share some practical lessons learned from the SHARP program. Okay, good afternoon. Let me just uh, get us oops, went too far. Okay. Um, so, the email subject will dive into the discussion of the chart playbook. Uh, just wanted to briefly um, update the, the committee on some concluding activities related to chart phase two. Uh, so, you can see here we're engaged in contract closeout, uh, continued learning and dissemination amongst the chart playbook, the Anderson I motto, um, as well as continuing with auto family school uh, evaluation. So uh, in the fall time frame, we'll come back to the board for a larger uh, summation of the chart program to date. Um, but really wanted to apprise you of some work that we're doing on this, what we're calling a playbook, um, which is a, really a, uh, an output of the program that is very much in keeping with the aims of our care delivery transformation work to uh, really put some information out there about uh, promising practices and lessons learned to really support population health management programs um, that are addressing the needs of complex patients for the social, behavioral, and medical needs. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to you. Good afternoon. Well, thank you. I'm um, really happy to talk to you about the playbook, um, get your thoughts and feedback. Um, it's been a tremendous undertaking by the team. Uh, as well as with some of our external stakeholders, our chart champions, the uh, CMS regional Quinn QIO health centric advisors. And so I'm, I'm really proud of it, and I think our team should be very proud of it too. Um, 
So as Kathleen said, uh, this is not a report. This is a guide. This is meant to be sort of population health manager program, uh, excuse me, the population health manager's handbook uh, to think about different ways to approach population health management, the various stakeholders he or she will need to engage to advance this kind of work. And it draws across you know, the $60 million tranche of investment across 25 different authorities in the Commonwealth. Um, notably, not you know, the high fancy academic medical centers, but organizations that really needed to dig deep and figure out how to innovate. Um, uh, I, I'll also say, in collaborating across the team, we work with uh, our HCII colleagues who have developed some niche knowledge on things like patient stigma, um, which is obviously very important as you think about population health management, particularly around behavioral health issues. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we did as part of our process was stand on the shoulders of our own giants. So you might remember a while ago, uh, the HPC did a learning and dissemination strategy stakeholder engagement session um, in which we asked a few basic questions. What do folks want to learn? How do they want to learn? And what practices should the HPC adopt and sort of support? So we used those insights. And we designed the playbook to be very practical, as succinct as possible. Um, and with uh, a variety of strategies that could be employed, layered strategies we talk about, complementary strategies. Um, and so it's not um, so prescriptive in that if you must do this and that, but it offers a, a range of important considerations that a program manager uh, or an executive champion at a hospital or other kind of provider organization might want to consider. So we spent a lot of time thinking about the voice. We didn't want this to be so lay and casual as to not be taken seriously, nor did we want it to be uh, a sort of stuffy academic paper. We wanted to get right to the point because everyone's very busy in healthcare. Um, and we thought about you know, the fact that there was a common theme, which was that across the chart program, we were really trying to drive the care outside of the walls of the hospital and keep it there to avert reutilization of the acute care site. And the, the, the vector arm of this was primarily a combination of a multidisciplinary care team using enabling technology products and really getting to know the multi layers that a patient has or that a person has to really understand what's driving their use of the healthcare system in a way that's not optimal. Um, so that brings us to the sort of chapters, if you will. So the first chapter is how do we identify these patients and what are some what are some criteria to consider and what are some operational strategies to consider? How do you then establish a new kind of a relationship with the patient so that it's not routine care, but it is really stepping back and asking the question about how how we can really help today? And then um, I have to you know appreciate some of uh, our chart champions. We initially penned the third lesson is called serving patients. And one of our wise chart champions said, I don't I don't want to hear about serving patients anymore. I want to hear about collaborating with patients. And so we you know we this is just a moment to sort of reflect on the very careful language we tried to use not only to convey the concepts of what was done operationally and what, what's important conceptually, but to try to use this as a platform to push a more progressive way of talking about patient care and talking about how to work with various members of your staff. Um, and that brings us to lesson four, where um, it, we really sort of dive deep on how can a program manager leverage different, new and different roles and new and different responsibilities um, to provide this care, particularly as we're now really trying to push the paradigm outside of the hospital, trying to push the paradigm to increase the engagement with community partners. Um, and and improve the ability to work with agencies for which some of these patients are served by clients. And then overlaying the whole thing is a, um, a good section in which we talk about how to use data to drive your operations in an iterative way. Um, so there, there we, we really dive deep on some of the key performance indicators that we used in the chart program. We talk about different ways to interpret these, how to construct a dashboard, how to use that dashboard not only to guide operations, but also communicate with your leadership to build a business case for this, or to communicate with leadership to enhance the relationship with community-based organizations. 
And then rounding out the whole thing are, is a compendium of tools. Uh, these are the tools that were developed by our open age journal program. And you know, all of these tools, all of these insights really are a synthesis of what happened across the cohort. It was a tremendous undertaking. We leveraged some with, with a number of our fellows in the room. We leveraged the work of the last crop of fellows who did some of this promising practices identification work. Um, so it's really nice to see that live on. Um, and, and these tools are designed to be um, either um, sources of inspiration for the next program that exists, or things that can be pulled right out and used tomorrow. So they've been de-identified of the particular organization names. So let me give you a little bit of an example. Before we have a uh, dive into examples, do any participants have any questions or at this point? Great, thanks. So one, I'm just going to give a very, very small snippet here. Um, so on the, on the lesson where we talk about identifying patients, you know, there are a number of strategies that can be used. And of course, it, it should align with the overall goal of the project. It should align with what the baseline metrics that your organization indicate are areas for improvement. So on identifying patients, you know, you, you could approach it from a clinical criteria-based uh, strategy thinking about both the criteria themselves and the way in which you operationalize this. And we've leveraged the great analysis done by our sister agency, CHIA, in which they found that the rate of readmission when there's presence of behavioral health comorbidity is much, much higher. Heads nodding, because we've known that for years now, right? Um, but we, we go beyond just use these criteria and we talk about the various approaches in which you might use this. So you could use an administrative based approach in which you use claims data, but there are inherent challenges with that. You might miss a bunch of patients because of the way a behavioral health issue was coded or, or not coded at all. Um, you could over identify if you're only trying to target patients who had a recent behavioral health issue, but you have a, a claims set that includes very, very old behavioral health diagnoses. Um, or, or you could have a combination of the two. And so we, we approach this and we talk about the value of potentially using the clinical data at the point of presentation, but recognize that it's a little more resource intensive. Um, and the other huge strength, of course, of this approach is that it is actually in that moment. Waiting for claims data is not really responsive to the needs of an organization or the patient. So that's one snippet on identifying patients. Um, another cut is to sort of think about um, opportunities to improve acute care utilization using a much simpler rubric, which is just based on the historic utilization of that particular patient. This is another great, great analysis done by Chia in which they found sort of moving from left to right on this graph. A very small percentage of patients, 7%, account for what, yeah, almost a third of all of the admissions and almost two-thirds of all readmissions. So by targeting this very small group, you can have an outsized impact of acute care utilization. And so in the playbook, we talk about the pros and the cons or the strengths and limitations of this kind of approach, what you might be missing, um, but why it is a why it might be a, an effort worth trying out. So that's just a, a little bit on patient identification. And then while uh, social determinants of health or health-related social needs are, of course, an incredibly important concept. It's still a new concept for a lot of our organizations. And it was new for CHART too. Um, all of our frontline staff can speak at length about the challenges the patients face. Um, but it was very clear that the systems to support accurate screening for them were just not there yet. So we provide this framework, and I, I think this is really an opportunity for us to move forward um, more broadly. Trying to keep it brief, I'll just round out by uh, saying the, the compendium of tools I reference, um, this is uh, an outline of the tools that we have. And the example we have here on the page in front of you is, um, it, it's, this is not high tech stuff, right? With large format business cards, but it's the kind of thing that can make a big difference to a patient who feels isolated, lost from care, um, you know, particularly in the aging population. Um, but, you know, what we've tried to do is, is bubble these really useful things, we call them the secret sauce of what makes programs work really well versus sort of well, um, and and sort of pull them up as, uh, as useful to a program manager. 
So I appreciate your feedback. This is obviously a very small snippet of sort of what's under the hood. Um, I think this is great. I, I, um, I appreciate the fact that you're paying attention to voice and, and the audience. But if I think about all the presentations that have been before us by uh, chart recipients, it, it's the patient stories that I remember. And so just a recommendation to include some of those patient stories, because that's what people are going to relate to. I'm glad you mentioned that, because they are in every chapter. Patient stories and provider stories, where providers are saying, this enabled me to free up my, my, my time to do what I really want to do with these patients. So I appreciate that. Um, that's great. Um, the, the, the tool book, uh, the, the playbook is going to be Helpful and probably even be multiplied as helpful as it were possible and not be to arrange a series of uh, conversations, webinars, or uh, dialogue. If you, 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 you hand this to a manager or a clinician, or you're still going to have some problems. And I think if you were able to host some chats, Expected uh, September. Great. Right. Uh, work over the summer. <laughs> yeah, and today. <laughs> so we are. Um, our next meeting is October third, and then followed by a meeting on uh, November twenty eighth, a committee meeting, and then. Uh, Thank you all. Thank you. We're adjourned. Good job. <laughs> Thanks.